Um, Whip around. I welcome to all the viewers watching on Rock This TV and just ask everyone to turn off their mobile phones or switch them on to flight mode. Um, I'd like to extend a warm welcome on behalf of the committee um, to our witnesses from the Department of Finance. I welcome Mr Derek Moran, Secretary General of the Department, and he's joined today by John McCarthy, Mary McSharry and Jerry Kenny. From the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform, I welcome Mr Robert Watt, Secretary General of the Department, and his colleagues Patricia Coleman, Mary Austin and Ken Cleary. And I just want to first um, outline some formalities. So I wish to advise the witnesses that by virtue of section 17.2.1 of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. If you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that where possible you should not criticise or make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. Finally, members are reminded of the long-standing ruling of the Chair to the effect that members should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. So I'll first call on Mr Moran for your opening statement. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, pleased to have the opportunity to participate in the discussion today. Um, I'll keep my opening comments uh, very brief. A recent report published by UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change highlighted the magnitude of the global challenge. Addressing the threat of climate change is a priority of government, as reflected in programme of government. It's a whole government issue and requires a joined up effort. In her introduction to the Citizens' Assembly third report, the chairperson acknowledged the topic of climate change, quote, is incredibly broad, wide ranging, and affects all of us in one way or another. Um, there is no single solution to addressing the challenge of climate change, and a collaborative effort is required across government involving a range of interrelated actions and actors. A targeted balance between exchequer sports expenditure, taxation policies and regulation are necessary to deliver upon our climate change objectives. Tax policy has an important role to play in contributing to our decarbonisation objective, but the complexity and the need for balance in policy actions was recognised in the Assembly's recommendations. The qualifications recommendation three on taxes on carbon intensive activities refers to the need to protect the poorest households and recognition of the ancillary recommendation three on the impact of agriculture sector of the economy, particularly the rural economy, has to be taken account of in the transition that sector towards um, 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 alternative models of production. Tax taxation and pricing is a very significant aspect of contribution that the Department can make in, in, in this regard. Others, other issues include ongoing work um, with our agencies, such as the launch of Ireland's sovereign green bond, ICE of investment supporting green technology, and the promotion of sustainable and green finance sector as part of the work under IFS 2020. Our existing taxation is positively contributing to, to climate change. The, the extent to which it can and should do more is a matter of ongoing policy discussion. Recommendation three of the report highlights an acceptance of paying higher taxes on carbon intensive activities, subject to qualifications such as spending increase in revenue or measures to support low carbon transition. The government is committed in the mitigation plan, national mitigation plan, to carbon pricing as part of a suite of policy measures to address and reduce greenhouse gas emissions over time. However, we also need to understand that its impact on low-income households, on households for whom at present there is no realistic substitute to, cons to consumption of carbon commodities um, for home, heat and transport. The Assembly recognised this challenge for poorer households in its qualifications, the recommendation. Understanding the impact of carbon pricing on emissions is imperative. In this regard, the Department has worked with the SRI and published a report in October 2018 that provides a better understanding of the environmental, social and economic impacts of increasing carbon taxes. It found that doubling, a doubling in the carbon tax to €40 Euro a tonne would result in something under like a 5% decrease in greenhouse gas emissions, a very positive impact from just one measure. While this would be a positive contribution, our objective is to also under, it also underlines the importance of pursuing complementary policy levers in conjunction with taxation policy to support transition to a low carbon economy. To build on this work, the SRI are currently developing a multi-annual model to better inform our decision-making into the future, which will be capable of modelling a carbon path taxway which captures behavioural change on the part of producers and households alike in response to policy initiatives such as phased increase in carbon tax rates over time. On Budget Day, the Government reaffirmed the intention to put in place a long-term trajectory for carbon tax increases up to 2030 in line with the recommendations of the Climate Change Advisory Council and this committee. 
Um, this is an explicit acknowledgement that carbon pricing and carbon tax in particular has a key role to play in the transition to low carbon economy. In recommendation 9 of the report, the vast majority of members of the Assembly recommend the State should immediately take steps to support transition to electric vehicles. To support the achievement of this goal, there are already a number of tax incentives in place to encourage the uptake of electric vehicles and, 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 more, carbon efficient, and more carbon deficient vehicles. For example, in, dish, in addition to the vehicle registration tax relief of up to €5,000 and the SEAI purchase grant of up to €5,000 already in place, 2018 saw the introduction of a 0% rate of benefit in kind on electric vehicles. The new accelerated capital allowances for gas propelled vehicles and refuelling equipment is being provided in the Finance Bill 2018, designed to encourage the uptake of gas propelled commercial vehicles as an economic and environmentally friendly alternative to diesel. Ireland's CO2-based VRT and motor tax have been, have been redesigned towards incentivising the uptake of lower emissions technology, whereby the higher the emissions, the higher the tax. This charging system was introduced in 2008. In order to take account of technological differences in January 2013, a revised banding structure um, was also introduced for both motor tax and VRT. A zero emissions ban for electric vehicles was also introduced for motor tax purposes. The introduction of these measures has been effective in influencing purchasing decisions in favour of more fuel efficient vehicles, with a significant increase in new vehicles purchased in the lower band categories. Um, it's of note that in 2009, um, only 13% of vehicles registers were in the, in the, the 0 to 120 gram band. It's now increased to 20 uh, to 77% band, and from virtually nothing, there are now about 4,000 electric vehicles on the Irish roads. Um, the launch of Ireland's first sovereign green bond of 3 billion by the National Treasury Management Agency on 10th of October is a significant development, as will assist in funding the exchequer investment, commi invested, investment committed. While the proceeds of the bond are remitted, like all others, to the central fund, the yields will be channelled to projects with environmental benefits. Eligible green projects, such as uh, for, the uh, Irish, for the first Irish bond, issued include sustainable water and waste management, clean transportation, environmentally sustainable management of living natural resources and land use, renewable energy, energy efficiency and climate change adaption programmes. The issuance of the bond was met with very strong demand, with a total order book of over £11 billion. With regard to imperative to mobilise private capital, I also note the importance of the work of IFS 2020, which has concluded green and sustainable finance strategies, uh, strategy priorities in the 2018 Action Plan. Just last week, Sustainable Nation Ireland, which has a role under the IFS 2020 strategy to support and promote Ireland's green sustainable finance hub, co-hosted this year's EU Annual Climate Innovation Summit. This summit was held on the 6th and 8th of November and attended by 600 decision makers from across Ireland and Europe. Officials from the Department have also worked closely with Deputy Pringle on the Fossil Fuel Divestment Bill 2016, which was passed by the Dáil in July and I believe before the Shannon this week. This bill requires the NTMA as a custodian of the Strategic Investment Fund to ever ensure that it does not directly invest, invest in fossil fuel undertakings and to divest from any investment that, it becomes, that, that is or becomes a fossil fuel undertaking. At a more micro level, but in keeping with recommendation two of the report on retrofitting and regeneration of public buildings, the recent renovation of the department's offices and government building have resulted in an annual electricity bill savings which are ongoing in the region of €60,000 per annum. This is a in this redevelopment, we were very aware of the need to significantly reduce our energy footprint. To conclude, I'd again like to thank the committee for the opportunity to discuss the report and recommendations of the Citizens' Assembly, which is an important aspect of the National Dialogue on Climate Action. Progress has been made, but will, we still have a very long way to go with significant challenges ahead. Thank you very thank you. much. And I now ask uh, Robert Walsh, Secretary General from the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. You have thank you, Chair. It's a, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here. And as the, the committee is aware, when it comes to climate policy, uh, we have a significant challenge. I'd like to set out why I think this is, what we can do about it, and the specific actions that are relevant for our department. As the committee is aware, climate is a public good, and the story of modern humanity has been our ability to conquer the elements but it's hard for us to conceive a world radically altered by rising temperatures. This perception gap collides with our well-known bias towards the immediate and general we're bad as society is sacrificing now uh, to benefit later. And this effect, I think, is compounded when it comes to climate change because we never had to deal with a situation where the consequences of a problem are so far removed from the actions we must take to deal with it. And the price that we pay for emissions we release the atmosphere today will be borne by future generations, our children and their children. So naturally, government departments focus on the interests of the general public and society at a given point in time. 
and the determination of the public interest is filtered through the views expressed by stakeholders and ultimately the political system. And because of our biases, we underestimate the impact of current behaviour and we continue doing uh, business as usual. So this uh, status quo uh, bias, I think, is reflected in our pr approach to date when it comes to climate policies. The actions that we've been pursuing have evolved to be compatible with existing policy priorities across a whole variety of areas, rather than specifically targeted at delivering the kind of change we need at the scale required. In other words, we've pushed open doors in respect of certain policies, where the evidence suggests that reductions in emissions at the scale required will involve significant winners and losers and have significant consequences for society. So what I describe as a well-recognised problem, the adverse effects of emissions on society collectively rather than those individually responsible for their emissions. They are external to the market or externalities. There is not enough incentive for individuals, whether business or consumers, to reduce uh, emissions. In my view, the best way of addressing these externalities is to place a price on them. The European Wide Emissions Trading Scheme is an attempt to do so for emissions in sectors such as electricity, generation, other, other high-emitting high sectors. Because every installation has to pay a price for every tonne of emissions it releases, it bears a direct cost for its emissions and is incentivised to find new and creative ways of reducing them. Even with the flaws of the ETS, the impact of pricing carbon in power generation has seen emissions from that sector consistently decline across Europe. With an effective mechanism in place for the ETS, the primary focus of policy is to reduce emissions in respect of the non-TS sectors, where liability for non-compliance rests with the state. The first question is, do we have enough least cost abatement options in the policy system? And I think the biases that I've outlined translate into what we, we term the principal agent problem, which is significant in this area, because responsibility for climate action rests with the Minister for Climate, but responsibility for policies to reduce emissions, particularly in the non-ETS sector, fall across many uh, government departments and many different agencies. And like other countries, we have structures in place to try to address this problem. But I think we should consider whether these structures are likely to be sufficient or if they need to be complemented by more stringent central mandates, or perhaps even replaced by mechanisms such as making individual departments or ministers more directly responsible for specific emission or targets relevant to their sectors. Irrespective of the type of structures we have in place, we need to develop new climate policies and measures and need methodologies to assess options across sectors. There is no easy way of deciding whether we should prioritise actions in any given sector. That's why, in my view, the first question we should ask of any proposal is how does this initiative help us to meet our climate uh, targets and at what cost? In other words, we need to establish the marginal cost of abatement for potential options. I know the committee has been discussing this uh, over the last number of months. And once we know this, uh, we know what the economic opportunities are, we can have a discussion, a proper discussion about the policy trade-offs and make progress in terms of the options we face. Carbon pricing, as Secretary General Moran has already outlined, either through ETS or taxation allows market discovery. This mechanism allows market agents to establish least cost opportunities and provides them with the incentives to take appropriate action. These market mechanisms may need to be supported by expenditure measures to encourage, for example, early adopters, or may also need to be underpinned by regulations that can provide investment certainty to either consumers uh, or businesses. And an interesting example in this area is in relation to electric vehicles. There are generous supports available for electric vehicles at the moment, both expenditure and taxation. And as the technology advances and the cost of an electric vehicle becomes competitive with that of fossil fuel, it will be no longer uh, appropriate to reward early adopters. Instead, the role of government will be to ensure the regulatory environment supports EVs drivers, ensuring there is sufficient supply of charging points, for example, and there is competition supply of electricity through, through charging. In the interim, as this example, until there is critical mass sufficient that the market can provide this infrastructure, it is developed and funded by, by the government. So in terms of investments funded uh, partly or wholly by the taxpayer, decision makers in the public sector need to reflect a realistic estimated shallow price of carbon to ensure that decisions reflect the cost of emissions in the future uh, and of course the, the, the benefits of abatement options. And I will return to this in a moment, Chair. In terms of our department, we are contributing to this policy work with the levers at our disposal. The mission of the department is to serve the public by supporting the delivery of well-managed, well-targeted and sustainable public spending. In my view, when it comes to climate change, this means public spending that supports the achievement of Ireland's low-carbon transition in the most cost-effective manner. It means targeted expenditure while allowing market mechanisms to deliver carbon reductions in the most efficient manner. In terms of project appraisal, we have just published significant proposed reforms to the Public Spending Code. In a major departure, we now require all government investment projects to price at future greenhouse gas emissions at the estimated cost that Irish society will have to bear in reaching our climate targets. 
Uh, in effect, this trebles the cost of greenhouse gas emissions that applies today, with the price reaching €32 Euros a tonne by 2020, €100 Euros a tonne by 2030, and €265 by 2050. And this responds to a criticism that's been made of the public se sector code for some time, that we're underpricing the future cost of carbon, and that we need to have a much higher price reflected in decision-making, and we've, we've taken steps to address that concern. These moves will ultimately reduce the viability of certain projects that produce emissions and critically place a high value on projects that actually cut or abate emissions. We are also lowering the discount rate to applies to the government investment appraisal from 4% to 4%, 5% to 4% over the longer term, and this discount will decline over time. These reforms mean that investment decisions will more fully reflect the climate consequences. <laughs> Finally, the Irish Government Evaluation Service was created to enhance the role of economics and value for money analysis and public policy. IDIS has already conducted reviews of areas of climate-related expenditure and will continue to do so in the future. And I think, Chair, this is uh, a big task for the system in our department and across the different departments to assemble the evidence required to inform government of the decisions that are being taken. There's an enormous amount of work required in terms of looking at options, how much they cost, what will be the, 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 the emissions reductions uh, from these options. So, in summary, and, and very briefly, in terms of uh, what we're doing, I just highlight the following. Uh, number one, supporting policies to price carbon. Uh, we believe incentives matter, and the best way of encouraging behavioural change is to place a price in behaviour that we want to change and encourage people towards the alternatives. And applying, uh, as the committee will recall, a, quite a trivial chart for a plastic bag a number of years back, lowered plastic bag usage by 95%. Now, I know in that case there was a very clear, significant alternative uh, so the elasticity of demand was, was very high uh, in terms of the, the, the response to any price change, uh, and that isn't exactly analogous or comparable in terms of the climate, climate area, depending on the type of change we're looking at. But it does show how price changes can impact upon behaviour, depending on the availability of, of substitutes and alternatives. On a larger scale, in the UK, as recently as 2012, 40% of their electricity came from coal, and this year, up to the middle of the year, at least 6% of their electricity came from, from, from coal. So you can see within the energy sector, uh, that example, and we have other examples which the committee are aware of, a very significant change in terms of the fuel mix within the electricity sector. The second issue is having a, a shadow price of carbon for government decisions, which properly reflects the cost of emissions. And as I mentioned, just as prices matter to the individual, so too they matter for government decision makers. We are now pricing the carbon emissions of any new government investment at a price that will cost us to eliminate those emissions at a later date. This raises the bar and will help to avoid investments which lock in high patterns, uh, carbon patterns of living. Thirdly, delivering, developing least cost options by estimating the cost of abatement options. Making effective policy will involve hard choices and trade-offs. To enable these choices to be made, we must provide government with the evidence that allows them to compare and contrast potential climate measures across a variety of different sectors. This means examining progress each measure will make towards our targets and the potential costs associated uh, with this measure. Uh, we are working with government departments to ensure that when government is considering climate policy, it has the necessary information to make an informed decision. Fourthly, in relation to examining structures to ensure that we address the principal agent problem, uh, the department is working through the existing climate structures established at government level. Uh, we need to ensure that we have the necessary structures to drive the change across government to reflect the scale and urgency of this challenge. Finally, in relation to leadership, uh, our department uh, leads in a number of areas in relation to climate change. The Office of Government Procurement are actively working with the Department of Communications, Climate Action and Environment to upgrade our procurement guidelines to ensure we can source goods, services or works within the, the public sector uh, with a reduced environmental impact. Project 2040 made a commitment that every single building in the public building stock will achieve an energy efficiency rating of at least B by 2030. Uh, and to achieve this commitment, the OPW are working with the Department and SCIA on a pilot scheme. In 2012, 12 buildings underwent a significant energy uh, efficiency upgrade, uh, including our own building on, on Marion Street, and this figure increased to 50 this year, with a further 40 buildings planned for 2019. And the evidence from the program, uh, from the pilot, that this will allow us to develop a program sufficient to, to meet this, this target that we set out in Project 2040. Uh, and this, this, these initiatives are primarily financed uh, by the Exchequer. Uh, just in conclusion, I think uh, obviously Ireland can't solve this problem on our own, given our, our scale and our contribution to global emissions, but we must show that as a developed country we are capable of making the, the necessary changes. Overcoming the various biases which, are, which relate to our society and other societies uh, that I've talked about earlier require uh, commitment, the kind of commitment that cross-party committees uh, can deliver. 
This is why I, think, I don't think this committee should underplay the challenges uh, we face. Addressing our emissions will mean short-term uh, challenges and pain for individuals and groups, but will benefit us ultimately in the long run. And I do have a concern uh, that if we promise society, people, uh, individual groups, that this will be easy or cheap, we won't build the kind of support necessary uh, for the difficult decisions that we have ahead. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I just have one question before I, I hand over to my colleagues in relation to the National Development Plan. Um, there's 22 billion euro ear earmarked um, for climate action um, measures and 8.6 billion for sustainable mobility um, over the next 10 years. And I understand, Mr. Watt, that you're a chairperson of the um, Ireland 2040 Delivery Board. Could you talk to us a little bit about the work of that? Because there's a lots of different groups and boards at de departmental level, government level, to, um, and we need to get was, a sense of the, I suppose, the, the work plan. What is the work plan in relation to the delivery of the climate action side of the National Development Plan and also in relation to the National Development Plan, the, the carbon impact of that? Has that been carried out? Thank you. So the delivery board, uh, so it's chaired by myself and Secretary General John McCarthy in, in the Department of Housing. Uh, and as you know, Chair, Project 2040 brought together capital plan, what would have been the NDP, the traditional capital plan for governments, along with the National Spatial Planning Framework. Uh, the planning framework that we devised and we think this is a very important change so that for the first time we have a spatial plan for the country which sets out where we hope the new homes uh, will be built and where people will live in the future along with a capital plan so that they reinforce uh, each other that decision making in relation to the spatial dimensions of our planning mm -hmm. are reflected in, in capital spending and, and vice versa. So I said at this group which is in effect uh, has the main departments and delivery bodies that are responsible for delivering uh, the plan uh, and we've met I think, four or five times so far where we discussed the challenges in relation to uh, delivering the plan. So we've had presentations from each of the departments and agencies setting out uh, what they're doing, uh, the challenges, the time frames uh, and we're focusing on issues at the moment like value for money, uh, construction inflation, uh, issues around planning, uh, how we can ensure that we can deliver on the targets that, that are set out uh, for government. So that's the main, that's, that's separate from uh, specific issues in relation to climate, whether there are separate structures within government in terms of, of climate. Our focus is on delivering the overall plan of £116 billion. and of course within that there are issues in relation to, to, to climate. There's the energy efficiency measures in terms of the, the retrofitting scheme. So we will receive updates uh, on that from, from the Department and from SEIA. And then there are other investments in relation to uh, public transport, uh, metro, buses, other areas that, that fall within that remit. So it's that chair, so the board is, is focused on delivering uh, on the plan. When it comes to uh, all the dimensions of, of, of climate action, well then there's a separate committee which is, which is uh, I think, chaired by the Department of Taoiseachs, an assistant secretary level, a senior, a senior officials group, and that's charged with, with coordination and delivery of climate action across, across the main departments of government. And of course they do feed into each other, because the, you know, in terms of progress with Project 2040 has an impact upon uh, our, our various targets uh, and their view on the evolution of climate policy will have an impact on how we deliver Project 2040 over the years ahead. And how do you prioritise then expenditure um, around climate action? How, how does your department do that? How do you pri prioritise expenditure so, in relation to climate action? Which projects are, how are they chosen? What is that process? So, so the departments are responsible for, so let's say uh, in relation to the energy efficiency area, so there's a budget there, I think it's four and a half billion in relation to retrofitting and the department has to come forward with its plans in terms of how they will ramp up the various schemes and initiatives in order to, to retrofit uh, the homes and meet the commitments we have within the plan. So it's in the first instance it's for them to prioritise. We have a five year envelope set out for, for spending within the first five years of the plan and that's quite detailed in terms of where we'll spend in, diff in different areas and the department uh, is charged with delivering on that. Now of course so that might change if if, for example, there's a delay in some initiative or project, well, then another project might, might take its place in terms of the queue. But ultimately, it's up for the department uh, to deliver on its, its programmes based on the allocation that it's Every individual department. Every individual department. Then so the main. How do we, I suppose I'm coming from the vote, how do we climate proof and prioritise when different departments are coming to your department saying, we want X amount of money for. Is there, is there an engagement in relation to climate action? How is this project going to be more environmentally efficient than 
another project. Is there, does that assessment take place when you are so, working with other departments? So when it, when, it, when it comes to looking at detail of the climate impact on, on policy changes, work has been done and more work needs to be done in terms of establishing exactly what the climate impact would be and what the cost of those policies are. And I think that the TRAM, the TRAM committee is looking at this uh, in detail. And I think, Chair, it's fair to say that there's an awful lot of work needed to be done to establish across the system. So which, which initiative is going to give the, the, the greatest bang for our book? Uh, which will actually reduce emissions uh, and at what cost? And an awful lot of work needs to be done both within individual departments, like for example, within the retrofitting space, what types of initiatives will actually move us forward in terms of improving the energy efficiency of the housing stock? It's not a straightforward issue. It's a question of, of financing. It's a question of you know, do, do, do households have the, the ability to raise the money required? Are they motivated? Do they see the benefit? Uh, are they willing to overcome the hassle of retrofitting the homes? So a whole variety of, of finance and other barriers that will impact. So it's up to the department to establish what's the, what are the best options uh, and then to make the case for funding. And within the envelopes we've set out, there is significant funding there, for example, in relation to, to retrofitting. Yeah. I suppose the general point um, I'm making is if you know, a particular department is going, coming for, forward with a project that might seem like it's a a cheaper option, but in the long term it might have negative climate impact, um, and that assessment is what needs to take place. Yep. And every individual department is always fighting for their own amount of money, and what's the oversight in relation to climate? Who is adjudicating in relation to the long term effects that will have on the environment, whatever be it transport, education, whatever department? So, the, 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 I think one of the issues, certainly, which is a, was a gap in the system, was the price that we put on emissions. And we had a, a price which was under 10 euros a tonne. And now in the revised public code, which is spending codes got out there, we have very significant increases in the price uh, per tonne of carbon. So that will discourage investment that leads to an increase in emissions or locks us into a, to a particular pattern of living which is carbon intensive, but will also will provide very clear incentives to prioritise projects that would actually lead to abatement. Uh, and that, that will have a, a material impact over time on the choice of projects. But that depends ultimately on the two things. Has the system done the work to establish what those, what those right policies are? And do we have the right structures to ensure that they're fed in appropriately and they're, and they're prioritised? And that comes down to ultimately the priorities of individual departments and the political leadership, of course, as well, across the system. Thank you. I'm going to go to uh, Senator Lombard. <coughs> Ten minutes and I'll, I'll indicate after three. That's okay. All right. Good job. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge and welcome the two general secretaries of their two respective departments and welcome to this very important hearings. Um, could I start off with um, Secretary Moore and regarding the taxation system we have in Ireland at the moment? Uh, what is your view regarding the taxation system? Do you think there is environmental goals attached to our taxation system at the moment? And where do you believe the vision needs to go so we can move to a kind of a, a low carbon economy itself? So, in other words, are we going to have our policy at the moment? What major changes are required to ensure that we can change our policy to make it more proactive? And do we have that vision at the moment within the department and within governments to actually work towards those issues itself? Regarding carbon, I think carbon will be one of the big issues that we'll discuss at this hearing over the next few weeks and months. Um, I realise that the Climate Action Advisory Council made a submission, I think, regarding the actual where carbon should be priced per tonne. I think they were hoping it would be coming around 30 euros a tonne for the previous budget. Budget. It didn't move, unfortunately. Can I ask your opinion of where you believe that carbon pricing is going to go in the next decade regarding just talks of going to 30 euros a tonne by 2030? Do you believe you're going to have a yearly increase in that carbon? Do you believe it's going to all come in the last day? Or will people believe it'll go up to, it'll go up to 80 euros a tonne by 2030? Or how do you see that gradual increase in the actual carbon price itself? And then how do you believe we're going to deal with issues regarding fuel, uh, uh, fuel poverty and people of economic need that require, unfortunately, fossil fuels at the moment? So there's two elements to, on how we need to balance it. And that's going to be very important so we can take society with us. So I am generally concerned of how we can actually move to this um, low carbon economy and then keep this the spectrum of society that needs support in the loop so they can be actually supported itself. And regarding the actual carbon going to eight euros a tonne by 2030, what's the timelines would you be considering as a department to have the vision to drive forward? 
and they're just interesting <coughs> questions that, in particular, your department need to give us guidance on. Regarding public expenditure, um, I think procurement, procurement is a big issue and has been a big issue across all departments for an awful long time. And this low, lowest price principle has been an issue that we've discussed at several committees regarding um, where we believe you know, the, the best value for our money c could be. Where do you think the environmental factors are going to come into that actual ske schedule going forward? Um, I realise the chairperson mentioned an issue um, of schools. The schools that we built in the last decade all had, gas, all had oil burners attached to the lowest cost syndrome that we actually drove as an economy itself. Where do you see those guidelines going? Renewables will be more expensive first day, but the long-term benefit will be there for us for all to benefit from. Even turning to a gas boiler rather than um, an oil boiler, boiler, these are all, you know, comes under the procurement of, of government itself. Where do you think the vision is going to come at that? Where do you think the review, the changes are going to come? And do you think it was a mistake over the last seven or eight years what we've done with, as the chairperson mentioned at our former um, hearings regarding the actual oil in the schools, do you think we should we lack that vision or do we need to move to a, a different fear regarding where we're going with procurement itself? Yeah, but. To come in on that on any order you wish. Okay. Yeah, um, sorry, uh, I will. Thanks, Chairman. Um, I mean, I suppose, I mean, we have, I mean, in terms of the taxation size system, we go back as far as 2008, 2009, we did carbonise how we tax motor vehicles. We did introduce a carbon tax in, in 2010, 2011, and we saw a progress, progression in both of the, them up to about 2012, and uh, with the, 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 the carbon tax increasing from initial 15 to 20 euro, but it's been flat ever since. Um, in terms of motor vehicle, excise duties and so on, they did increase, but they've been unchanged since 2012 as well. So there's an element in which using um, fiscal instruments, using taxation um, um, for this purpose has sort of, uh, um, um, there, there, there hasn't been any change over, over, over time. Essentially, the carbon tax, um, I mean, the speed over the next 10 years in which carbon should will go up, will ultimately be a policy decision for the government of the day. Um, um, but there are examples where, where governments have set out um, a trajectory for carbon tax, for example in France, going from about 30 euro to 85 euro over a period of five or six years. Um, the implications in terms of, of, of fuel poverty for them is quite different because it doesn't impact on households as much because 75% of their energy generation comes from nuclear power, for example, they're much less um, 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 fossil fuel intense. Um, so, but, but the reality is, is that if you increase the carbon tax, you generate revenues. Um, by generating the revenues, you've got revenues to recycle in to mitigate some parts of the problem. You can't mitigate all of it, but where there's fuel poverty issues, you can do, you know, through the winter fuel scheme and things like that, you can actually address where the pressure hits most. For me, some of the important work that we've done around this has been the, the, the report, and I would recommend it, um, um, that the SRI, we worked on with the SRI, which we published back in October, and for the first time we're able to, for any given level of increase in carbon tax, we can take a view of what the likely impact on emissions is. is. So, for example, it said that for €20 Euro impact at doubling of, of, of the carbon tax, you would see about a 4.7% reduction in emissions. And that's very significant, if you like, in the overall target of trying to get down 30% reduction um, 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 over the next decade or so. Um, the CACC talked about going to three times that. Yeah. Um, now, the likelihood is that won't be linear. Um, we're doing some work over the next 12 months as a priority about looking at what the multi-annual impacts of that will be, how that will be phased and so on. But if, if, even if it's not linear, if it's not three times 4.77, if it's somewhere between 10 and 15, again, as a single policy response, it is a very significant contribute. it will be a very significant contribution to meeting, meeting, meeting the um, decarbonisation uh, um, um, goals. So I, I, I view those as, as important, and that work will inform how we map out the trajectory over the, the, the next period. But I think mapping out a set of steps over the next 10 years will be important, um, because I think if you don't, then the chances are if you pick off issues on an annual basis um, in an annual budgetary cycle, then you're not going to make a huge amount of progress. Um, in terms of, 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 of vehicle taxation, um, there are changes, and fairly fundamental changes, that are happening um, over the next 12 months. Um, the emissions measurement for new vehicles is changing. Um, and 
called the EU Commission anyway, as we move to the HLTP, PT? WLTP. WLPT, it's, it's, um, if, if I want detail, I'm Mr. Kenny to fill in. But it's, it's, it's given a much more realistic measurement of what the actual emissions from vehicles are. And you'll see, on average, the emissions measurement going up by about 20%. And that, again, is going to have a significant behavioural change. And we all saw, already saw that with the changes that we made in 2008. So I view, I mean, I think having a plan and marking that over time, the recycling of revenues into where we, um, uh, um, you know, kind of where we see the, the pressure points. And the interesting piece about the work done with the SRI is for a 20% increase. I think it's overall, in fact, on the economy, John, it's fair to say, wasn't that significant. It's very trivial. Yep, yeah. very trivial. Um, the impact on, on, on households, the energy costs for the lowest income households went up by about 2.9% and about 4.5% for highest income households. The effect on net income, the lowest households see their income drop by about 0.7% and the highest by about 03 And that's where the, that's, that defines the space that you have to, have to go in and, and address um, and, and mitigate. And the mitigation would have to be at the lower at, at the lower end, but you're generating the revenues that per permit you to do that. Sorry, John. Can, can I just make one follow-up point just to emphasise what the Secretary-General has said in terms of the carbon tax pathway and the importance of signalling uh, where things are going in the future. That's important, I think, because it creates certainty. It means that economic agents don't lock into expensive systems right now. Uh, it creates certainty regarding what the future price uh, will be, uh, which will help reduce emissions uh, directly. But it will also signal to economic agents that it will be increasingly profitable to invest in low carbon and zero carbon alternatives, that it will be uh, profitable to invest in carbon capture and carbon storage and so forth. So by creating that certainty now and by setting out a kind of a medium term trajectory, uh, I think you can overcome so, some of the, uh, the issues associated with a sort of a cliff edge effect. And there was other questions there, I think, Senator. Yeah. Um, to Robert Clark, yeah. In relation to, to procurement. Yeah. So I think that the procurement uh, raises, a, raises a big issue in terms of whether we uh, have a, an approach based on regulation, where we're prescriptive and we say, okay, we support that particular technology, or whether we uh, ensure that decision makers reflect the higher price of carbon that I've mentioned. And we have it in the public expenditure code put out uh, new estimates for the future costs which will incentivise uh, renewables more efficient forms mm -hmm. compared, to, compared to what would have gone in the past. So that will send the necessary price signal to decision makers. But the issue about the heating oil in schools raises, it, raises an issue. Because let's say 10 years ago, uh, a school decided to go with an option which would have been much more expensive based on a given view of energy costs. Uh, another committee in this House would have criticised the Secretary General of the Department of Education for allowing schools to misspend public funds, okay? Because heat pumps, I guess, are renewables, whatever the alternatives, would have been much more expensive on that view of what price their energy would have been. But of course, if you have a different view about emissions, a different view about energy costs, well then, you could argue that you take a different view. So you don't just look at what the cost would be for the first number of years, but you look at what the cost would be of heating in 20 years' time. And that requires uh, the system, not just our system, but the wider system, to, to stand back and reflect upon what the cost of those choices are. Because we might be saying that in the short run we'll have school buildings that are more expensive, but they will lead to more, more efficient use over the life cycle. But that obviously comes down to difficult choices and in the short run other things will have to be foregone within the education system in order to, to afford that. So I think that raises the type of policy decisions, that policy choices that, that we have to face. But I think our approach would be a combination of regulations and there is the, the, the near zero emissions directive now from, from 1st January next year, so all, all public buildings have to adhere to that, that standard, but also within that ensuring that we look at the overall costs over time, hopefully reflecting what the, the, the true cost of, of carbon will be in the future. And do you think we're, like as departments, I can't actually speak on every department now, but as a, as a whole of government effect, do you think there is that, that ethos of taking the longer views there at the moment regarding procurement? Or is it literally we're down to the, you know, the cheapest price? Do you think, is that vision there, or how much change is required in the well, departments the, to the, get that vision? The, 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 the lowest cost uh, reflects the lowest cost of build and the life cycle costs as well. So it's not just the build costs. 
So the, the, the evaluation should reflect that, does reflect that, but it's a question of ensuring that the inputs are appropriate. And this is a judgment call around future energy bills and, and the price of carbon into the future. So it's a judgment call. Uh, and we put forward a view now, and we're waiting to hear back views from the system on this, but we put forward a new view in terms of, of the price of emissions. But this is not uh, cost-free or risk-free for the public sector in terms of making those decisions. <coughs> Thank you very much, Senator. I'm going to move on to Deputy Timmy Dooley, and you have ten minutes, and I'll indicate after three. Just Thanks very much. Just to thank Mr. Warren and Mr. Watt for the presentation. Um, I suppose just maybe to get started, Mr. Watt, on the on the potential fine side for the state if we don't um, reach our targets by 2020, and obviously the impact thereafter. We've 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 heard different potential costs now. It's one thing that you guys are good at. Maybe it's not about spending money, but you're pretty good at planning and, and, and estimating what those costs would be. So I'm hopeful that you'll be able to identify what your best estimate at this stage is. And then really, I suppose, where we've got to, to move that along from is if, if the cost is X, and if in recognition that heat and transport are the areas where we really have slipped on, um, and uh, we've had our own interactions with various departments and some departments are better than others at maybe addressing the, the climate change part of, of, of their work. What, what role do you play in, in, in trying to encourage departments to assist you in saving the state from having to make those or, or to pay for those fines? So I get your overall role from a budgetary point of view is it's loaves and fishes at times uh, and it's trying to identify what are the best projects that will give the best bang for the buck. In the absence of those projects coming forward, um, what role or insights can you give us, or, or do you generally give government as a whole to try and, and move that piece on? And then just maybe to, um, uh, to Mr. Morn um, uh, on the taxation side, I think you've kind of covered the, the, the carbon tax piece, which is, 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 is well recognised. Um, there was just one thing, and I, I was vocal about it at the time, and it was in relation to last year's budget uh, and the BIK exclusion for our exemption for a year. And you know, the minister in his budget statement indicated that that more than likely be a review and. Well, it'd be fine on the night. It'd probably be extended for two years, and I think that 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 happened, or that was that accounted for this year. But you can see when 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 measures like that aren't concrete enough at at, at, at an initial stage, it doesn't instil confidence in um, a sector to go ahead and invest because nobody shifts from petrol or diesel to an electric vehicle in in in, in large numbers um, unless there's certainty and. If there's one thing you guys know about, it's about the importance of certainty. Um, and that, 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 that was an area where I thought it was remiss from the government at the time, that I didn't nail that down in the finance bill, making it very clear that this was going to be a five-year project, because generally cars get, well, I don't know how some companies do it, but personally you'd be trying to see what value you had after three, or you'd have it written off over five or maybe seven uh, if, if you didn't do a lot of mileage. So, those kind of measures are important signals, and they've got to be up front. So, as well as that, on any of the other, have you any other ideas on the, the taxation side about how we can improve uh, the uptake of electric vehicles? You're right, we've got to whatever it is, 4,000 vehicles from you know, a relatively small amount. I think when, when ourselves and the Greens were last in, in government, we were, we were getting towards or had projected to getting to 50,000. Now, look, I, I accept a lot of things happened in between. Um, but we're a long way short of that, that critical point where you then have a second-hand market and you have a rollover and you actually have a marketplace. Uh, and there's no way that we could suggest that four or 5,000 vehicles is anything like a stab in the marketplace. So I'd be interested if you have any other ideas. Um, Can I bring in on those deputies? And you might have time at the end. Uh, Mr. Watt. Yeah. Yeah. Deputy, for, for the, the comments, I suppose. The first thing to say is it's, it's loaves and fishes time all the time, yeah. uh, not just some of the time. It's always loaves and fishes, uh, every day, <laughs> never. It's more acute maybe at budget time, but there's never enough money to go around, as you know. Uh, huh? Well, <clears throat> no, no comment. Uh, in terms of the, uh, as you know, uh, Deputy, it's, the, it's compliance costs, not fines. Yeah. Right? It always is a... a, a pedantic point, but maybe it is, it, is, it is critical here. It's a compliance cost. 
So for 2020, and I don't want to contradict our colleagues in climate because they're, they're the experts, but there's a shortfall of 17 million tonnes. We've bought about 5 million credits already, but the price of tonnes during this period of 2020 is, is negligible. The, the market, the prices has fallen, has fallen through the floor. So the, 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 the cost, the compliance costs for this period are, are negligible. They're, they're neither here nor there. Of course, for 2030, based on the projections we're looking at, we're looking at a shortfall of around 100 million tonnes or thereabouts. Who knows? But, you know, that's not a, it's not a bad estimate based on, on uh, business as usual and where we are. Now, we need to work through the full impact of some of the measures that have been taken out by government to see what abatement they'll, they'll reduce. But you are looking at, or deliver rather, but you are looking at 100 million. So the, 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 the compliance cost then really depends on your view about what the price would be. Uh, so and we, we have a view on what? <clears throat> we have no idea. Okay. We have absolutely no idea, and nobody does. And if I knew, maybe I wouldn't be sitting here yeah. uh, in this committee. I'd be off trading, trading uh, mm. future futures in uh, in, uh, in cost of carbon. If you knew, uh, uh, you'd be doing great. Who knows? Like the the, the obligations will be tighter across Europe mm. next time round, so there won't be as much to go around. A lot of the lower cost options have been taken. So I would imagine. <clears throat> I think it's a fair assumption. That the price of the price of per tonne of carbon will be an awful lot higher mm. during the next period than the period that we're going through now. So yeah. if you just take it, then just take 10 million, 10 euros, 15 euros, twi take any, take any, 32. But take any number, take any number you wish, right? And then multiply it by 100 million, and you have, you have what the potential mm. compliance cost would be. It's compliance cost. And you never know how things are going to pan out, and, and there's lots of things to happen. Mm. But they're the type of the type of the type of metrics that are yeah, and that are really reasonable. In terms I, suppose, of I, I suppose we do need to do some scenario planning, and I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure you are, and you, you may not be in a position to, to show too far ahead in terms of your yeah. guesstimate, but it's better, to, in my view anyway, that we're spending that money now in terms of trying to develop programs and plans that will reduce our yep. compliance cost, um, because in, in, in essence, we can be pedantic about the thing, it'll be, it'll, it'll be money out of the central exchequer, it's, a last, yeah. it's going to make your loaves and fishers, fishers a hell of a lot more scarce. When you reach that point, so so it, it, that's why it would and, be helpful. I think I even think, in advising other departments, so about I think definitely making this money is available now. I think rather definitely than this is this is the, this is the critical issue. Mm -hmm. Let's say Deputy Ryan is correct and it's 32 euros is the is mm -hmm. the is the, the cost. Then all options that have a marginal abatement cost of less than 30 mm -hmm. are options that we should be pursuing now. Mm -hmm. So if somebody comes into this committee and says that's really expensive, it's going to cost 25 euros a ton of carbon to abate. Hmm. That might look expensive, but it's cheaper than the compliance. And that is the decision that we have to take. That's yeah. the matrix. And you can't, you can't centrally plan this, even within our system. Yeah. You have to say to departments, that is the price. And that's what we're trying to do with the, the spending code. So we're, we're, we're trying to say, that, that is the likely price. And that's the price you need to reflect in your decision making. So if a project has a, po uh, sorry for, if a, project has a positive uh, cost benefit based on 30 euros a tonne, in 2030, if it's a positive CBA, well, then that project is worth pursuing. Yes. If we're right. Now, of course, if we're wrong, like, let's say Deputy Ryan is wrong and it's 10 euros, well, then we could have done a lot of things that we should have, shouldn't have done. We would have been better off buying compliance as opposed to taking the expensive action. But if it goes the other way, and if it's 50 euros, well, then there are a whole variety of other things we should have done, which would have been expensive but still cheaper than 50 euros a ton. And that's the policy choice. And the challenge so is that... have a positive impact on removing greenhouse gases yes. from the atmosphere. So but, but yeah. That, yeah, like so, obviously the, the whole, we, have, we have our target to meet, right, no, to make exactly. our contribution to keep the temperature below yeah. the level. But the key issue for, it, for us is the estimated cost of us meeting that target. Mm. And if it's 32 euros, well then policy decisions which have that cost, but which are less than 32 euros, are worth taking. Okay, if, if that figure is correct. Yeah. Okay, no, no, maybe yeah, just that's where the big thing for me is 32 yeah. euros per tonne. And, that's the, and that, is, that, is the, that is the policy challenge. And that is the challenge for, for, for the system and everybody. And that, and that, and that's a number then that you use as a, you know, just for, for the creation of a hypothesis. You, you don't have any number or you do have a number? Or oh, well, that's the number we're, that's the type 20. of number we're thinking about, Chip. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Do you want to come in? Uh, just a very small clarification, Chair. Just say the 32 euros figure is actually for 2020. 
It's 100 euros is the, is the figure higher. for 2030, yeah, that's what I would have thought, rising yeah. to 265 euros yeah. by 2050. Yeah. So those, we've put an entire range, we've put an estimate for each year into the public spending code now based on this new mechanism for calculating the cost of carbon, which, as Robert said, is going to be based on our estimated cost of reaching our climate targets. So that's okay. where we've come up okay. with those figures from. And they're based on the modelling work that was done for the National Mitigation Plan um, by the Technical Research and Modelling Group. Okay. But let's just think about just, just, just to tease us out a bit more. <clears throat> so the cost of compliance is borne by all the taxpayers in the country. Mm -hmm. Okay? So we all collectively have to pay for this. The impact of a given decision in, let's say, agriculture, for example, or any, pick any sector you wish, will have an impact on particular groups. It's not uniformly across the taxpayer base. And that, of course, is a big policy challenge as well, because the cost of compliance will be borne by all of us as society, but the cost of actions yeah. will be more concentrated in particular groups within society. And that's why the that whole heat and transport fact, area, rather than the product, what we might refer to as the productive side being, being agriculture, if we, can, if we can get much more activity over on that side. Or, and we had, like, we had um, Quilt to here yesterday, and you know, they have, uh, not Quilt, but Bordemona, they have some really exciting, yeah. uh, you know, new opportunities in addition to their own decarbonisation programme. They obviously have uh, a remit to try and ensure that they stabilise the economy in which they're based in and create employment, and they have some, some really good ideas there. And, you know, it would be, it would be preferable um, that they'd get support to manage that side in, in, in terms of carbon sequestration, yeah. in terms of plant, planting certain... Yeah. Uh, and there is, and, the, and the, sorry, Chair, and there is, there is a big challenge in terms of the transition, mm. manage that transition, yeah. because, like, within that case, it could hit the, the middle of the economy. So there's a role then for the rest of society to try and mitigate the impact on particular regions, which might, which might be disproportionately hit by a transition yeah. to, to a different, a different. Uh, and just cut time, economy. Mr. Moore, do you want to come in on those questions? Yeah, points very well made in terms of certainty. Um, um, that the, 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 the BIK has been extended for three years. Um, normally we put tax expenditures on a three-year review cycle, but I do think when you're trying to change behaviours, it may well be to give it a longer, yeah. longer lead in terms of the, 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 the it's, it's, it's well made. In terms of EV, EVs and the numbers on the road, I agree it's a start, but it's a long, long way to go. I think in terms of the carrot part of it, in terms of the incentives, I mean, there's a list of seven yeah. or eight subsidies or, or supports that are there from the, the, the port is grant of up to 5k, the, the, the VRT reduction of, of up to 5k, the, the, the grant for putting in your charge, but all of these sort of things, there's, there's probably but as much as you can do on that side. The stick part of it is is to rebalance, you know, yeah. in terms of other vehicles and discourage you know, to make it more costly to use mm. other um, 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 heavy carbon using um, 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 vehicles. Yeah. And it's the sort of changes that are coming in over the next 12 or 18 months, you know, will we'll help tilt that balance. So it's a, it's a carrot and stick yeah, I have some, piece. So, yeah, I have some concern well, about that, just, just very briefly. Really, really just quickly. some concern about that. Even if you just see the fluctuation in, in the price of fossil fuel at the pumps at the moment, um, and it doesn't seem to be enough of a deterrent even. And we've seen those, I think, and we're, we're quite used to that massive fluctuation in oil prices. Um, so so I, I think you've got to go further with the carrot in the initial stages uh, to try and achieve that. But that's just, just to, to round out the, the chair, I mean, if we have a 10-year plan for carbon tax, then you are pricing forward and saying yeah. this, is going, this is going up, and then it relates yeah. back into the incentives. Okay. Okay. Ten minutes, and I'll indicate after three. Thanks. Thank, you. Um, thank you very much for your presentations. Um, my first question is to Mr. Watt, um, and that's in the area of governance. So uh, it's been very uh, good to read. Um, how in your presentation, uh, how you like identify and address the attitudes that has led um, us to becoming in Ireland known as the climate laggard, and um, so at least uh, it, that's you know the base where we we are at at the moment. Um, so the Oireachtas for many years considered the best legislative approach to ensuring that the government and civil service gave the necessary priority to climate change and so adopted the Ac uh, Climate Action and Low Carbon Development Act in 2015. However, this act has not put us on the path of transition in line with the national transition uh, objective um, and the Taoiseach has acknowledged this and, and NGOs um, have said that in, we're second in Europe um, and the Climate Change Advisory uh, Council says that we're going completely 
in the wrong direction. And the state is now, as we've said, is facing uh, legal action um, because we're not meeting our obligations. Um, the Citizens' Assembly, um, in their deliberation, uh, their first recommendation was that um, there would be 97% uh, of the members recommended that there'd be some kind of governance body set up um, and that we'd look at specific functions, including the setting of uh, a body of fi uh, five-year targets and a function of pursuing the state in legal proceedings to ensure legal obligations are met. So um, my question, Mr. Watts, is um, you uh, mentioned in uh, page two of your submission some of these issues, and I'd like you to go into more details with regard to governance and how you see um, a, a governance mechanism as supporting um, Ireland in this regard. Um, my second question is, um, as you're aware, the Climate Advisory Council has modelled um, in part the UK Climate Change Committee and in part it was modelled on the Irish Fiscal uh, Advisory Council. Um, and both of these uh, have been far more successful in getting their government to take advice. So um, have you any insight as to why this has happened, so why they're making more progress than we are here in Ireland? Um, and then with regard to Project uh, Ireland 2040, um, your presentation emphasises the importance of public spending that supports the achievement of Ireland's low carbon transition. Um, did your department produce an analysis of the climate impact of Project Ireland 2040 in order to enable the government to ensure its decisions in that major plan um, to support the achievement of the low carbon transition? And I ask this because um, none of us have seen an analysis and we've been told that 20% of the plan will support low uh, carbon transition. But of course, uh, if much of the other 80% is undermining transition, then it's not going to work. So do you at this stage have an analysis of the greenhouse gas emissions which will result from the implementation of Project Ireland 2040? And if not, um, are, is your department uh, prepared to do a retrospective review um, so that we can see what the impact is going to be? Thank you, Senator. Thank you. So, so just in relation to the first, uh, <coughs> the first uh, uh, comment, I don't agree with the Citizens' Assembly's recommendation. I don't know if we're allowed to say that, are we? Uh, I don't agree with that about an independent body. I think that's, uh, that's a bit of a cop-out. Uh, it's for the Irish Government and the Oireachtas to decide uh, what decisions we're going to take here, because these involve significant implications for, for society and citizens. And the notion of having an independent body that's going to I uh, suggest Derek Moran, our, our Minister for Finance, that carbon tax is going to be 200 or whatever euros by 2030 or whatever it happens to be. That's not going to work. These involve political decisions that would have to be decided by uh, the government and the Oireachtas uh, in, 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 in the normal course. And this comes to the essence of, of public policy and, and politics. So uh, I don't agree with uh, the Citizens' Assembly uh, recommendation. Uh, we already have an independent body, the Climate Change Advisory, advisory uh, Group, which does an interesting job and a good job, and they have lots of... Uh, good things to say, but this involves having to make difficult decisions. But can we change the structures within the system to help us make difficult decisions? I think we can. So I think it comes down to issues about how we're organised within the government system and the relationship between the Department of Climate and the other departments. Uh, and I mentioned uh, the difficulty that the Department for Climate uh, is responsible for the targets, but isn't responsible for the, for the levers. So how do you have proper structures within government, cabinet committees, other structures to ensure that there's genuine responsibility taken here? And I think it's about the different options that in the paper I set out, some options about you know, ascribing target savings to sectors that are responsible for them. So saying to agriculture, you need to deliver that amount, transport needs to deliver that amount. The challenge with that approach is that flat rate reductions uh, across each sector reflecting their contribution doesn't necessarily reflect the marginal cost of different options. So that might be an inefficient way of doing it. That might actually lead to, to higher costs than we have to incur. But we need to look at different ways to ensure that the system is actually galvanised to deliver on this. So I think it's within government that we need uh, Senator, to look at the governance, not externally. I don't think an independent body uh, is, is, uh, is, is going to help. In terms of uh, the, second, the, sorry, the second question was in relation to... The, um, no. the Climate Change Advisory Committee uh, was modelled on the UK. Oh, the other the the UK, yeah. yeah. So I think... Yeah. So, like, I, I think so. Uh, other countries are making more progress than us, if they are, because 
the policy options are easier and with the cost of those options are, are lower than they are here. And that reflects the fact that we have an agricultural sector which takes a significant share of the non-TS. Uh, we have homes that are bigger than other countries uh, which uh, produce, I think, 58% emissions uh, per home higher than other countries. Uh, we have a spatial structure that's different to other countries where we have more reliance on the private car. So it's a function of the nature of our economy, society and the emissions. So it's not because other countries are doing more, it's because it's easier for them to do more relative to us because of the particular challenges that we face. Like agriculture accounts for two-thirds of the non-ETS. Uh, the herd has gone up by 22% over the last three years. Milk production has gone up by 27%. So there are very clear, very clear decisions, very clear consequences here. So the fact that the UK or other countries are doing better than us is, is, reflects the unique structure, the different structure that we have compared to them. It's not because they're being braver or doing more or taking more actions. I haven't seen that in any, in any event. I'm happy to be contradicted. So I don't necessarily believe that it's because they've got an independent body that's forcing the system to act a different way. I think uh, our performance reflects the difficult structures and the emissions uh, nature uh, of, how, of how agriculture and, and so on has evolved. In terms of, I, th I did say at the start in relation to Project 2040 that it didn't go through in detail and looked at all the options and, and worked out. That's work that has to be done. So we need to go through uh, all the options. But there's, there's spending within Project 2040, which have an impact on emissions, and I think the challenge is to ensure that spending uh, reflects the, the, the cost of, of emissions in the future. So there's a lot of school buildings, there's a lot of renovation of the, school, the, of the school stock, for example. None of that is earmarked as related to climate, but of course how we build those, those schools in the future will be very important in terms of ensuring that they're, they're energy efficient and they minimise the impact on emissions. So I think right across all these policy areas, there's an awful lot of work to do to ensure that we're taking decisions. Uh, that it's going to make the problem any worse and that we are taking decisions to actually reduce emissions that we're making the, the, uh, the right decisions. Uh, so in terms of the, the plan, I think the government is committed to producing another uh, mitigation plan, climate change mitigation plan, over the next number of years and that will have more detail in terms of what the, the, the precise impact will be of a variety of issues that are, that are floating around. Just to, to support what Robert said, I mean, there, there is an analysis being conducted at the moment in terms of you know, how far the NDP will help us achieve our targets for 2030, and that will feed into the development of the National Climate and Energy Plan going forward. So I think it's important to remember that the NDP is a financial plan and you know, it supports the national planning framework. And this is why, as Robert said, we have this oversight group, which is the Project 2040 board, which is bringing those two strands together. But every, every element of spend, when it comes to public investment under the plan, that will be assessed using the public spending code and the appraisal. And then the new provisions in relation to the price of carbon will be captured. So we'll be, get a better um, understanding of the climate impact of that investment going forward and the cost of carbon will be priced accurately. So when will we see that report? Um, well, as I was saying, like the, the um, impact, like the, um, working out what, how far the NDP will bring us in terms of reaching our targets, that work has been done at the moment and that will feed in to the NCAP and that's to be available by the end of this year, the first draft, so that it will be available shortly, that analysis. Will the new code become live by the end of this year? When is it going to go live? Um, well, we're out to public consultation at the moment in relation to the elements that we've just discussed. But I mean, I think the intention is it'll probably be early next year that the, the revised code will be available. And just a point: will it be applied retrospectively? The in terms of um, the, the, the existing the, the, the new existing, code? Yeah, uh, it'll be applied to all pro all projects, all future projects, all future investment decisions. And just with regard to other countries, you know, like, do you see, um, I mean, we have economic growth and you said the rise in, in milk and yeah. uh, dairy, whatever, but like, how do you see we, us decoupling our uh, carbon emissions uh, in terms of, um, from the economic growth, yeah. given that the scale of the project, so, so or the, the dilemma we face? So. Uh, my own view, um, I'm not sure, I think this is, this is consistent with government policy, so <clears throat> I hope it is consistent with government policy, is that uh, the only way to, to, that we're going to achieve progress here is to uh, electrification of transport and heat. 
uh, and that's going to involve uh, significant decarbonisation of the electricity network, more renewables, and there's a technical challenge in terms of how much more intermittent power we can put on the grid. Uh, Deputy Ryan was involved in these debates when he was the, the Minister a few years back. Uh, this is not entirely clear or straightforward in terms of what, what the share of renewables can be in the network. Uh, it's a difficult issue. So that's number one, is the further decarbonisation of the electricity uh, sector, and then ultimately then electrification of, uh, of heat and, uh, and uh, transport. And transport will involve electric vehicles be becoming uh, more widespread. I presume when it comes to uh, heating space within residential buildings, heat pumps, price of heat pumps will have, to, will have to come down with a combination of renewables. So that's, I think, ultimately, so it'll be, it'll be technology over the next number of years if we have the right place, the right structures in place, the right pricing. I think the positive is that, I don't know about heat pumps, but certainly the price of, uh, of batteries is falling quite dramatically. Uh, and if we can uh, store all that cheap electricity in batteries, that will have a transformative effect, ultimately, uh, when it comes to climate and for society. That's probably the big, the big change will be. Uh, falls in, the, in, the, in the, the price of batteries and the extent to which uh, devolved electricity networks, as you know, Senator, can, can, can ensure that uh, we decarbonise and then we elect electrification of the, uh, the heat and transport systems. Did but it's going to look very different in the next 20 years. Questions answered there, Senator. Uh, uh, yes, yeah. I, I wanted a few questions from Mr. Just Moore. very briefly, you've yeah. gone over your time there, just to list out. So, um, let me see. Uh, in relation to your uh, presentation, like it's deeply frustrating. Nine years after uh, previous government introduced the carbon tax, the issues are ensuring that low-income households benefit rather than lose from the tax, and that carbon tax is complemented and other policies are still being treated as conundrums to be uh, solved or work in progress. And there's uh, different organisations like FASTA, the Foundation for Economic St uh, Sustainability uh, developed its proposal for cap and share um, two decades ago and repeatedly brought it to policy uh, makers' attention ever since. In essence, it's a proposal that the revenue from the price on carbon be returned to people on an individual basis because low in uh, income households use far less fossil fuels. They are beneficiary, net beneficiaries from cap and share. Um, and in 2008, uh, Another organisation, um, CORE, the Sustainable Development Council, commissioned a study on cap and share proposal, and similar initiatives uh, such as cap and dividend are prominent in policy discussions in the US. So all of this is in a situation where carbon price needs to go well beyond the 40 uh, euro per tonne the department uh, referred to. Um, and Mr. Watt referred to 100 euro per ton in question 2030. There, Senator, sorry. So the question at this stage is: um, the Department of Finance, um, have you considered how to ensure that low-income house households can benefit from? Sorry, I mean it's one thing. I don't think there's any conundrum. I mean, I think I've already said you take the revenues and you recycle it into targeted supports for low-income families to mitigate some or all of the. Of, 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 of the, the, the impact on them. Um, I think the, the, the situation we've got to is that we made a certain degree of progress and that progress stopped in terms of, 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 of carbon taxation generally. Um, and um, whatever we do, um, and, and I think it is important that we have a multi-annual plan, that within it bases both the increases in taxation and the ways in which you do this. And, and, um, and you know, having a plan means thing gets, things get Things get, uh, things get done. This is the, tra you know. the trajectory. The traject of, yeah, the trajectory. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. I'm going to move on to Deputy Deering. Uh, yeah. and, uh, I'd like to welcome the two Secretary Generals and your colleagues here today as well. A couple of questions for each group. First of all, uh, I think Mr. Moore mentioned about the incentives that were in place already. I think the words you used, you felt there was enough incentives there at the moment. Uh, I think, oh, I'm up in the question now, but I think that's the words you used. Uh, I personally think there has to be behavioural change in, in the whole climate discussion and debate. Uh, in order for that to happen, I think we have to have more incentives, in my opinion. Uh, have you looked at any more incentives within the department, for example, tax credits? Like we have tax credits in a number of different areas, uh, straight through the whole system at the moment. Uh, have you looked at the, the idea of maybe a tax credit for doing X, Y or Z, uh, to, to maybe as an incentive in that regard? And also have you looked at the idea, we've had a lot of talk in different areas in the last while about low-cost loans for, for refurbishment of, of or low-cost loans in different areas. Uh, and obviously the cost of doing a refurb on a house to bring it up to whatever standard is required. Uh, 
it's going to cost a lot of money. And I'd say if you do an analysis on the figures, I think that I hear somebody say in the past it might cost 50 billion over a period of time to bring the entire uh, housing stock in the country up to a standard that would be required to be that would be that would be carbon efficient. Uh, you know, to do that is going to cost a lot of money. The state, in my opinion, is not never going to be in a position to be able to do it for everybody. So the idea of a low cost loan. Uh, that we've had low-cost loans from, from a Brexit point of view and from different sectors over the last period of time. Have you looked at that particular initiative as well? Uh, I also feel, I, I feel in general that uh, you know, there has to be more carrot and stick in the whole debate. Uh, I think that has to be the whole selling point. Um, and again, on the whole selling point of the matter, the communication strategy in both departments I think is crucial. You know, if we can't sell the message of what is coming down the line, uh, the consequence of it, uh, the implications, uh, what is going to cost, I think Mr Walsh referenced earlier on about the costs and the difference and so on and so forth, but it has to be done in a language that everybody understands. You know, if we don't do that, I think we're losing the battle straight away. If we're playing catch-up, which most of the time is them to be, uh, and it's a fair fighting process, I think the communication strategy uh, needs to be developed very straightforward. And I would ask you on both sides uh, what, what communication strategy have you in place. Uh, and Mr. Watt, if I could, uh, if I could reference, uh, I think, a quotation from your own opening statement, um, and, and I quote: "The evidence suggests that reductions in emissions on the scale required will involve winners and losers, and have a distribution consequence on uh, consequence for society." Uh, I think that's obvious. Um, have you done within your department an analysis of the winners and the losers uh, in that regard, and the potential costs involved? Thank you. Thank you. I might bring in Mr. Warren. Yeah, I mean, my, 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 my point on the electric vehicles is that there are a lot of incentives there, and yes, there can, al there can always be more, but I think if you take the total and there's seven or eight, and maybe there needs to be a, a, they need to be coalesced into a, a single, bigger, more transparent you know, uh, um, piece. But, but my, my, my point is, is there are two parts of the equation. There's, there's the carrot and the stick. You know, kind of the carrot is the incentives, and the stick is how you treat other vehicles with... with, with, with uh, I wasn't specifically talking about the electric vehicle, but in general. But, no, I, but, but in general, I mean, it's, it's get the balance. But there's also, you know, it has to be remembered, there are incentives and grants on the expenditure side, you know, not just the tax side, and it's to get the best value out of, out of, out of both. In terms of, of low-cost low loans, certainly that's worth looking for, uh, look, look, looking at. Um, in terms of um, um, tech support, in terms of renovation and, and in, in including energy, feed, we have had the home renovation incentive for a number of years, um, uh, which is there, which, which essentially refunds you the, 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 the VAT content um, on, 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 the, on, the, on, the, on the on the change to do. I mean, it is a model that 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 that, that could be developed. Further, if that's what was wanted, because it is a, a, there's, there's a, it's a refund of income tax, but it's actually just the, nom the, the additional VAT um, component on it. So there are a number of things. In terms of communication strategy, we we publish every year, um, you know, for paper on environmental taxation um, um, through the tax strategy group. Uh, um, every summer, it gets a fair amount of attention, and I, I think it's it's right that we keep these things to the fore in terms of what we're doing um, or what we could potentially do. Um, and, and, and 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 as I say, each July. We, 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 we publish that, in addition to the type of work that Mr McCarthy is doing with the SRI around um, um, the research and the analysis. So that's Can I add and a quick one on that, on Deputy Deering's one, is there any, is there any impact in having a low interest loan, because Mary Donnelly was here talking about, for example, the state can't do it all and private individuals would have to find ways of retrofitting their own homes and, for example, you could have, for example, a credit union offering a low interest loan. Is, have you an opinion on, I suppose, the, that, how that would affect the, the, the books, the state's books, as opposed to an income tax credit? Is there any well, I mean, it, it, I mean, preference from in, your point in, of view? In, in, in terms of a low interest rate for the credit unions and the banks, I mean, that's ultimately a matter for the credit unions and the banks, you know. Um, but I, I think instruments targeted instruments that, 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 that allow people reduce the cost of making that, you know, there is a, there is a, there is a benefit in whether it be a loan, whether it be a, um, um, a tax incentive, whether it be expenditure measure. I think we just, we need to bring as much coherence to all of these approaches as we possibly can. Sorry, Deputy Deering. Oh, I just want to make for in the end. Yeah, Mr. Walsh, do you want to? Yeah. Just uh, thanks, Deputy, for the questions. I suppose our departments were generally more in favour of sticks than carrots, but uh, that's maybe We're just the, <laughs> that's just maybe the, the culture of the organisation has gone back uh, a long time. But if you think about the retrofitting challenge for a moment, I think you do need a combination of policies. 
like it costs about, I think, about a thousand euros to heat uh, with gas an average home in Ireland, a thousand euros a year on average. Obviously, larger homes cost more. Uh, so retrofitting, so heat pumps cost eight thousand, nine thousand a year, eight thousand, nine thousand capital about costs, yeah. that can reduce. Uh, so a significant retrofitting depends, 10, 15, 20,000, it could be significant. So I think there's a variety of different elements. You have to have the incentive, so you have to, if it's more expensive, ultimately people will look over time about making savings. But then, you, so if they have an incentive then, are they willing to endure, endure the hassle, if we'll come back to you in a second, and thirdly then, can they access the finance? And there might be an issue then for low cost loans. But of course, who's subsidising the loans? Ultimately, you're talking about the state subsidising the loans, which is a cost to the, the, the generality of taxpayers. There are distributional issues there as well. Like if you're talking about uh, providing subsidies for better off households to insulate larger homes, that has a negative redistribution effect since the rest of us are paying for higher income groups. But there's been a lot of work done in the UK about why people don't retrofit. And uh, when it comes to, for example, your attics, uh, a lot of work done in the UK suggests the major, the major challenge was people just couldn't be bothered cleaning out their attics. Uh, and they decided to give grants to declutter attics. And this is what the nudge unit came up with. So rather than giving very elaborate grants to retrofit, to actually give a grant for somebody to come and declutter your, your attic for a weekend was, was much more effective. So I think there are a variety of different instruments here, nudges, regulations, taxes, financing instruments, ultimately that will... But as you said, Deputy, the, the, the state, through general taxation or through exchequer funding, can't do this job. It's, not, it's just not possible. It's just too, too expensive. And it'd be also wrong. It would be wrong from distributional aspects if it was try to try to do it also. In terms of communication strategy, I think, uh, I think this requires, uh, uh, if, if I think any society is going to engage in this type of change, enormous change, requires a, a, a wider political consensus. Uh, and that, that, that has other implications which are beyond, are, are not really my business. So I don't, think, I don't think it makes sense to think about, you know, a particular uh, part of the state talking about a communication strategy because the, challenge, the changes required are so enormous that there has to be consensus amongst political groupings and other civic societies, trade unions, other about how we do this. I don't think this change can take place incrementally or without that, that wider support. In terms of winners and losers, we, 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 we don't know all the policy instruments. So if we had a, a greater sense about what the policy changes, well then we could look through and have a better sense of the winners and losers. So, in the absence of that, but you know, so there's no analysis so, on yet. So, some of the work has been done, like like Derek and John mentioned in relation to taxation. So we have work the department has done, finance and the SRI about the distribution impacts of, on carbon tax. So we know because we know from the Living in Ireland survey, we know how much people spend at different types of household per income, different income decile, John. So we can work out the distributional impact of a carbon tax without uh, changes through the fuel allowance, which has been mentioned. So. Depending on the nature of the policy, and if, 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 if you said to us, OK, here are five policies or ten policies, go off and figure out what the effects would be, we'd have a, a reasonable stab at working out what the effects would be in terms of distribution. So that's the work that has to, has to be ongoing and continue. Okay, on that point, briefly, Chair Parsley, if you don't mind, uh, one of the decisions to send your recommendations, and I, I know you're, I take your view on the decisions to send your recommendations, was that there should be a carbon tax in agriculture and the agriculture sector, for example. Uh, has there been analysis done on that and the consequence, the potential consequence of that? Uh, I think you reference, yeah. uh, I think you're wrong, by the way, in regard to increasing the 22% in livestock numbers in the past period of time. I think that figure is wrong. I think it's overly exaggerated because there's been, there's been an increase, obviously, in the dairy sector. There's been a, a reduction by the same amount in the beef sector, I would say, to compensate for one against the other. So I would say the figure is more, is, it's in single figure, it's more so than the, the figure of 22% that you reference. There's been an impact. Yeah, but, that's what the, point of the, but the question on from the, the potential or the recommendation of the Citizens Assembly was there should be a carbon tax in the agriculture sector. Uh, has there been analysis done on the pension implications of that uh, for the whole sector? We hear on a daily basis about rural Ireland uh, and, and so on and so forth. Because the agriculture sector, as you referenced, both you referenced earlier on, is crucially important to the whole agriculture oh, yeah. rural economy. Sure. Yeah, yeah, thank I you. can say a few words on it, uh, if, if that's OK. Um, so, as, as both Secretary Generals have mentioned, we commissioned uh, the Economic and Social Research Institute to, to undertake the analysis for us. What it does is it looks at different sectors of the economy in, in very granular detail. It doesn't look at the agricultural sector per se. 
uh, from what I'm aware. Uh, what it does conclude, though, is that at an aggregate level, there is a very limited impact of uh, it does a five euro and a 20 euro increase in, in the carbon tax. At an aggregate level, the impact is, is fairly minor, but the most exposed sectors would be the transport sector and would be the natural gas supply sector. Uh, the sectors that drive the Irish exports, uh, sort of the high-tech multinational sector, they're not really affected that much. So the overall competitiveness of the economy is, is really unaffected. To come back to your earlier point and something that Robert was talking about, uh, it does look at the impact as not just on the productive sectors of the economy, but on the different households, the 10 different deciles, so the poorest, second poorest, to the richest, and, and so forth. And it does conclude that a carbon tax would be, would be regressive. Uh, so it does recommend that you would need flanking policies, as Derek has said, to address those distributional issues. Now, what I would say is that uh, that's just the first stage in the research that we have commissioned with the, with the ESRI. What we're going to do uh, and what the Institute is doing, and we will work jointly with them, is to look at how things evolve over time. So if you have a carbon tax pathway, in other words, not just look at the static impact, but look at if there's a pathway between now and 2030, how would the behavioural uh, impacts uh, be, and how would the different sectors be affected? And I guess you could probably have a more in-depth look at the agricultural sector within that analysis. So maybe this time next year, Deputy, I could probably be in a better position to, to, to quantify some of those. Uh, okay, Mr. Watt, yeah. Just... Before you start thinking about uh, taxation of agricultural emissions, if that's what you're suggesting, uh, Deputy, you look at the subsidies that are in place already, because there are already there's negative taxation. There's activities which subsidise the production of greenhouse gas emissions in the agricultural sector, which, are, which I'm sure you're, you are aware of in terms of the subsidies that are there. The numbers that I have, and I'm happy to go and check these, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't be that close to the, the herd numbers, but uh, uh, the, the five-year period, the number of, of, of dairy cows, which I know is in the, is in the totality, increased by 22... You have those numbers, actually. You have those numbers, 22% increase. Well, they're important, they're important, Chair, to to spell them out because this is the part, this is the issue, right? There's no point in getting away from it. The herd numbers increased by 22% between 2012 and 2026, and milk production increased by, by 27%. That's between 2020, 2026. That's between 2000, 2000, 2012 and 2016, Deputy, yeah. We'll, we'll get the, yeah, you know yeah. them probably better than I do. I'm going to bring in Deputy Marcella Corkin Kennedy next. Mm -hmm. Chair, and thank you, and Mr. Watt and Mr. Moore and, for, and your colleagues for coming in this afternoon. Um, I just wanted to address my first question uh, in, uh, to, to Deeper. Um, you know, it's an emerging that there's a whole of government and whole of society approach has to be taken uh, to address this urgently. And I heard you um, mention the Citizens Assembly recommendation and your views on whether there should be a separate body. Um, just uh, in relation to whether you have a view on what type of leadership, though, uh, needs to be um, uh, leading. Uh, is, it, is it something that you have examined in terms of uh, what other states are doing? Because there's been plenty of uh, discussion here on whether it should be led by the Taoiseach's office, whether it should be led by yourselves or who. Um, so I'm just wondering if you have any um, uh, other states examined in relation to what they're, they're doing around governance. Uh, in relation to the National Mitigation Plan, there is a, um, a proposal for a review on public expenditure, appraisal and evaluation. I'm wondering, have you plans for when that will take place? Uh, also in the National Development Plan, climate action is a strategic investment priority. And I was wondering uh, how you are going to prioritise climate action expenditure. Uh, I know that there is funding uh, provided for in terms of funds for climate action, the Disruptive Technology Fund and the One Billion Rural Development Fund. And what type of evaluation framework are you going to put in place uh, around this type of expenditure? Um, the other question I have is to finance in relation to uh, hypothecation, that dreaded word that I think you, you don't like, to, doesn't, it's not in the finance dictionary, but uh, there is some discussion around whether or not there should be ring-fenced funding uh, which is raised through the um, current carbon tax and if you have a view on that, um, uh, I also wanted to ask you on whether 
um, what you're doing in terms of investing the uh, money that you're collecting on the carbon tax at the moment, and if you're using that money to uh, transition to a low carbon economy uh, in some shape or form. Uh, also, in relation to whether there should be further incentives to encourage the public to move to uh, low emissions and electric cars. Um, I think that there seems to be a view that really there's a lot more that we need to do there. And also um, to acknowledge Deputy Pringle and his, 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 uh, his bill uh, and the excellent bill that he put forward and which was accepted. What are you going to do with the divested proceeds now? Uh, are they going to be invested in um, green and low carbon investments so that we can accelerate to a more sustainable economy? Thank you. Who would like to come in first? Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Deputy. Uh, just in relation to uh, the, the governance structure, so I suppose we have an open mind, uh, and I set out in, in my opening remarks some of the, the possible ideas. I think uh, having a department for, for climate action, I think, is important. Uh, but again, you know, it would be interesting to hear from the political side what, they, what, what their view is. So I, think that's, I think that's a good change to bring all together within one department. But of course, that department doesn't have responsibility for agriculture or transport and other issues that we're, or housing stock we're talking about. So I think it's about a combination of making that work effectively. There are different options in the UK. There's, there's centrally mandated targets, I think, from the Prime Minister's office. Uh, other countries have, have that. So there might be a combination of the, the, you know, the cl climate department plus more centrally mandated targets from, from, uh, from the centre of government, I guess. Uh, in the UK, they have sectoral targets allocated to different sectors, so ministers and departments have to are responsible for delivering particular targets. So I think there's merit in, in looking at, at all those options. I think we've an open mind on it. I don't know what's the best way, but I think certainly uh, we need to we have an open mind about the structures we have and be honest about are they actually working and are they going to be able to deliver the scale of this, this, this challenge. But ultimately this, this, is, a, this is, a, is a political, it's not, for us it's a political question about how the interaction between departments and so on, that's a matter for the, the Taoiseach clearly. In terms of uh, I've already spoken about the, the, the appraisal. We, 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 we just mentioned about it that uh, we have published the, the, the revised appraisal uh, of public expenditure, which sets out the, the revised price of carbon, which increases the price uh, into the future compared to where we are. And that will feed into the, 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 the final issue of your question in relation to assessing priorities and strategic investments that uh, what we believe is a more appropriate price of carbon will ensure that departments are facing the right incentives and the right costs when they're coming to evaluate a whole variety of different uh, potential projects. And a lot of that work has to be done in terms of, of looking at what the best options will be in the future. But we think based on a more realistic uh, price of carbon will help us get to the right decision making. So I think that the, 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 the two questions are interlinked. It's about having that code and adopting it, which we're hoping to do in the new year, and then ensuring that that's reflected in decisions that are taken ac across government. And there are a whole variety of issues that relate to that. Great. Mr. Moore. Um, very briefly, yes, you're right. Department of Finance hates high publication. Um, but I have said, you know, at the outset that, you know, in terms of carbon taxation, um, particularly if we have a multi annual trajectory for this, recycling um, um, revenues to mitigate some of the issues, and particularly in income distribution terms, is, is something that would be um, um, worth doing. Also, sort of I think better links up what you're trying to achieve in terms of addressing uh, whether some of the money is, 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 is going back. Um, in terms of um, um, the 430 million or so we collect from carbon tax at the moment, it does go into the general pot of taxation, but it's part funding. A lot of the stuff that's a national development plan um, um, in, in that area. Um, I mean, in terms of, of how the recycling of, of, of the carbon tax, I suppose in the end of the day, some part or all of it goes back into the mitigation, and ultimately that will be the decision for the, 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 the government of the day um, in whatever way it wants to do that. Um, further incentives, I think we've touched this on and off. I mean, there's always there will always be an argument for incentives, but I, keep saying, I think it has to be a balanced thing between stick and carrot, changing behaviours through a stick and incentivising people to do different things through, uh, um, at the same time. Um, in terms of the um, Deputy Pringles Bill, I mean, the ICE of Investment mandate changes in line with the legislation. It's an amendment to the NTMA Act, which will do, and that's, 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 that's the material effect. It changes their, their, their investment strategy in line with the, with the Act, which I think, if I'm right, it's, it, it goes to the Shannon this week, change the light title, and that's it, and then it's done. Yep. yep. 
Okay, I'm going to move on to Deputy Smith. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, the first thing I want to say is that I, I'm sort of feeling that we're in a bubble here. We're not really dealing with reality in the way that we're talking about this. We're actually talking about climate change. I'll just remind everyone. And I'd like to ask you if your department has looked at, read and studied the IPCC report recently. Um, because I think that the level of this conversation does nothing to deal with the urgency of the situation we're facing. And as you know, that that report actually warned us that within the next dozen years or so, we're in danger of overheating the planet to a degree where, there, where, where we're putting species and human life in, in real danger and we've done enough damage already. So I suppose my first question is on the whole issue of the carbon tax because, um, uh, Mr Moran, in your introduction, you, you say that the ERSI study shows that even if you double the carbon tax to €40 Euro per tonne, it would result in something under a 5% decrease in greenhouse gas emissions, which would be welcome, but goes nowhere near dealing with the uh, challenges we face. And then later on, you go on to argue that you don't agree with the Citizens' Assembly recommendation in, for an independent body. Um, and yet, there's a joke around this building that you're going into the, climate, uh, to the Committee for Climate in action. That's what's often said to me. We're going into the Committee for Climate in Action. And I think that that committee, or this committee, is getting uh, that name because the government's inaction on dealing with climate change is very, very apparent. If I was you and in your department, I'd be seriously looking at what do I do to double, treble the level of public transport in this country, to get cars off the road, to end that culture that you talked about where we drive to everywhere, to get rid of that culture, to get rid of the idea that fuel poverty is acceptable. The constituency I live in, Mavs did a study recently, and a quarter of all households live in fuel poverty. In other words, they spend more money on uh, trying to keep themselves warm than they do on food and in doing so they're burning up more and more gas and coal. These are the things that I think your department should be tackling and you, talk, you use the example of, of this sort of, I think it's quite an unfortunate example given what's happened recently in education, the choices we make about the types of school buildings that we uh, decide to spend money on and given the disaster that those choices have proven to be in the recent past, it was an unfortunate uh, choice of example but nevertheless it doesn't go near, it doesn't go near question that was put to me. Fine, but it's still an unfortunate, uh, for you, an unfortunate choice to be able to look at. And yet I know schools where the kids are trying to get money from the government to invest in solar power and they're knocking and knocking on doors and nobody's listening to them. So I would really welcome the establishment of an independent overarching body that would listen to communities and that would put pressure on people like you, uh, Mr Watt and, and Mr Moran, to say that the, the, your spending decisions are wrong, it's not doing enough to address the urgency of the situation and we have to start looking at tackling climate change in a much different way because when you say, and you did, you did uh, I think it was your own, your own submission again, you quote the Stern Review on Economics and Climate Change and it says climate change, the greatest market failure the world has ever seen and yet your briefing document at no stage moves outside the parameters of the free market and market mechanisms. You talk about cost abatement, carbon pricing, market discovery, no idea about how to tackle this except within the parameters of the market that has failed us in the first instance. So I think, uh, you know, the fact that your submission arrived very late made it difficult for me and my staff to challenge things in, in, in a more comprehensive way. I find it's a real impediment to the work of this committee that we keep getting submissions at the very uh, last hour. But nevertheless, they're hollow, they're shallow, and they do nothing to deal with the urgency of the situation. So I'd like you to answer uh, that accusation and to also answer me the straight question. Have you read the IPCC report and are you aware of the urgency of the situation we're facing? Deputy, who would like to come in on that? Mr. Moran. <laughs> um, Deputy, I, I referenced the IPCC report in my, my, my very opening statement, so um, um, I do recognise the urgency. In terms of the carbon tax, I mean, um, the 4.7% the, the reduction for a 20% 20, 20 increase, uh, or 20 euro increase, is an, an illustration of, of the potential of this. As, 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 as a measure for um, decarbonisation. The Climate Action Commission um, is talking about €80 euro 
you know, and, and you know, I have spoken already about mapping that type of change over a period of time, bring in certainty, bring in um, 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 a, a focus to the fact that this will increase over time. And while the, the, the net impact on emissions may not be linear, as in three times 4.7%, in terms of what we're trying to achieve over the next decade or so, it, it, it won't solve all of it, but it could potentially go a long way. And that's why the importance of having a multi-annual trajectory for this becomes hugely, um, hugely important. Okay, thank you. Um, I have, do, do you have another question there? Yeah, just a, it's just a question on, on the, the Citizens' Assembly recommendation on the review body. body, the independent review body. I mean, if on the one hand the Department of Agriculture is encouraging farmers to grow more cows and grow more herds for dairy and grow more for export, and they do, and not just the department but also the farming organisations encourage this, is at no stage would the finance department step in and say, hang on a minute, this is going to cost us a huge amount in the long run because of carbon emissions, and where is the joined up thinking? And I don't believe there is joined up thinking in the government, in the state, and that's why I totally agree with the Citizens' Assembly recommendation that we need an outside independent body that keeps an eye on all you guys and, and tries to force through that joined up thinking about the actual size and challenge and you know seriousness and urgency of the challenge we're facing. Okay. I'm going to, I think uh, Mr Watt has responded to that there earlier in relation to the independent body. Um, I'm going to move on. If well, I heard from well he did. You can maybe go back and listen to his, his um, response to that earlier, but it was raised by Senator but, To my question, have you read the IPCC report and do you think that this, your department is doing enough to face up to the challenge? So I have read the report, yeah, and uh, I've been involved in climate issues for about 20 years. I uh, worked for the European Commission a good few years back on emissions trading schemes and carbon tax and other initiatives, so I'm well aware of the issue. I don't think anybody should try to downplay or trivialise the challenge that we have here. And uh, I've engaged uh, this committee for the last two hours now, seriously, I hope, I think as Secretary General Moran has, and happy to do it another time, happy to provide any briefing. I think we've been fairly upfront and honest about our views. We've set out uh, where we think we need to go. So I, I, I think we have uh, set out uh, where policy needs to go, but it involves very difficult decisions that everybody knows, very difficult policy choices, and that's for uh, political leadership. It's not for myself and Derek. We're, we're here to provide advice and to implement policy, uh, and that's what we do. There's a wider, there's a wider political challenge that uh, has to be addressed. Thank you. Pringle. Uh, thanks, Chairman. And um, actually, that's, your comments are, are very appropriate because that actually gets to what I was going to ask you questions about, and the question about there has been a, a, a feel a wee bit of sympathy for you here at the committee because the intention. But the reason you would get from this is that you're the decision makers, and I don't think really you are, or maybe, maybe you are. And the politicians will tell us, if we politicians in here, they tell us that you're telling them that they can't do this, and um, we're saying, you know, so. What? Sorry. So I want to get to what, the, where actually, the, who makes the decisions, and maybe about, if we could talk a bit about how you actually inform the decisions. So, I mean, the politician, I presume, maybe I'm naive and uh, you'd put, put me right on it, but I presume the politician says, I want to introduce a carbon tax of 100 euro a tonne, and you say, well, this will do X, Y, and Z, one, two, three, this is the options, what do you want to do? And then the politician goes along with what you want. That seems to be the way it works. So, who, I, is that how it works, or what happens? Like, for example, like, um, like the, minister, the former minister that resigned for climate change said that he had recommended uh, that the National Depart Development Plan Coordination Group and TRAM considered, form, considered a form of carbon budgeting as climate policy management tool to aid in decision making, and then that went nowhere. So where did that stop? Is it, is it with the politicians or is it with officials, basically? So the, the it's our process. job to, uh, as you know, Deputy, it's our job to put in place the correct structures uh, to ensure that the system is in a position to gather the evidence and provide policy advice to government, and it's for ministers and for government to decide ultimately on the advice. And then when they make decisions, then we go off and we implement them. 
that's that's what we do. So we're not decision makers, but we are responsible for putting in place the structures and the process and having the evidence. And I've spent a lot of time, Senator Derek spent a lot of time here talking about about that issue. Uh, and that's uh, that's that's our our issue. What uh, I'm not quite sure what what Deputy Nocton was was was, was I haven't I haven't uh, heard his comments. I know there, there there are various discussions about how decisions on spending and tax in relation to the budget, how they impact on climate and how departments feed into that. There are ongoing uh, uh, discussions, but I'm not quite quite sure if I if I if I understand exactly the point that uh, the foreign minister was making. About, it's about the decision making. It's yeah. about how the decisions are made, get yeah. about being made. And what I want to get at is do you make the decisions? Or do the politicians make the decisions? Because the politicians will sit here and tell us that you make the decisions. Which, so politici which politicians say that? All of them. No, they don't. No, they, don't. <laughs> they all do it. <laughs> but the ones that I've worked with for the last 10 years don't. Well, they might not say it to you, but they'll well, say it to Well, I'll make a suggestion, <laughs> Deputy. And the politicians for the, all for the sheer, for the sheer For the sheer fun of it, uh, ask Deputy Noonan and Deputy Howland to come in and, 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 and give their views on that. We have seven direct work with those two gentlemen. And you can try Minister Dunahoo as well and ask him. Anyway, well, no, I think this is, has to be answered, and I don't know the time. Going to, I would like to hear from Mr. Moore as well. I mean, yeah, no, I mean, um, I absolutely, I did with, with Robert that I mean, at the end of the day, we provide the framework, the analysis, and so on and so forth, and the ultimate decision rests with um, politician. I haven't yet been approached by a minister to ask to design a hundred euro carbon tax. Um, uh, um, I, 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 it'll be an interesting day when I, when I am. Um, um, so but, the, 30, but, the 32 euro carbon tax, where did that come from? That's the, that's the shadow price of carbon shadow price, in the yeah. public appraisal guidelines. Yeah, but who's, who rated the 32 euro? The department we were responsible for that, but it was based on modelling work that was undertaken for the tram group. But did, did the minister ask you for a 50 euro tax? No, it was it was a no, commitment by government in the National Mitigation Plan to say the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform should review the appraisal guidelines to make sure the carbon price is as accurate as it could be. And following that review, so we've recommended a change in methodology that leads to about a tripling of the carbon price that's been used in this framework. These are, dra these are draft proposals, yeah. so the minister and the government haven't uh, signed off, but they will hopefully in the new year sign off on it. Just that the, the shadow price, the shadow carbon tax, and the, the carbon tax and the shadow price. Yeah. There's, there's no. a differentiation yeah. there. Mr. Moore, just want, just want to clarify no, something. No, just no, no, I just want to just make one, one of the contributions that we can make is by 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 producing as much analysis and research that's publicly available to inform the debate around these issues. And you know, we have prioritised various things in terms of our research partnership, which is the mutual between ourselves and the SRI, which gets gets published and informs the debate. So you know, the stuff that we've done around carbon that was published on Budget Day, the stuff that we've planned for next year in terms of the multi-annual trajectory, that's, a, that's an important contribution, and I think that's the bit we can... But in the end of the day, politicians make the decisions. Okay. Okay. Briefly, Just uh, Deputy. one final question, because I think this is important. You're saying this is very urgent and we have to make the decisions. That seems to be now, but this climate change has been about for a long time. Uh, you mentioned yourself, Mr Watt, that you've been working on it for 20-odd years or so. What's changed? Uh, I think what's changed is that people now actually believe that uh, climate change is happening. People believe it? Yeah. Or do you believe it? Or the civil service believe it? Or the politicians believe uh, it? I think society... I think society believes that the climate is changing. But it's been about for a long time. Like, what has the civil service yeah, done? People haven't believed it all the time. People have, yeah, the science has been clear for a long time. But people, people are now, I think, becoming aware of the potential effects of climate change. So the politicians... In a way which wasn't there before. So the politicians... Leave it there. Thank you, yeah. Deputy, Deputy Butler. You have much five chair. minutes, and I'll indicate after one minute, just so you know. Perfect. And, and my apologies for being late. I was at another meeting, and I just want to thank you for your time and for the, the documents that you provided for us. Mr Watt, you stated that we shouldn't underplay the challenges we face. We require changes to society on a scale not seen since the Industrial Revolution. We need buy-in across all sectors, obviously, across political sectors, across departmental sectors, throughout the whole country. The committee has previously raised concerns that there is a kind of a patchwork type approach to climate actions across many, many groups and bodies working away in their own area, but obviously a more unified cooperative approach is required to deal with these issues. 
Is this an issue that you're looking at and have you looked at examples from other states that are meeting climate change targets to see what improvements we could make? And my second question then is in relation to, we had the ESRI in um, at previous meetings and they informed us that 88% of houses constructed before energy efficiency measures were put in place. And we spent a lot of time teasing out the SEAI Better Energy Home grants. And we have learned um, from, the, from the statistics provided that the cavity insulation is the most popular grant, followed by the boiler, the heating control, and finally the solar panels. And obviously the reason I, I put to that, dealing with constituents uh, week on week, is the cost associated with, say, the solar panels or the heating controls. Whereas most people can make up the difference when it comes to cavity insulation, or even if they have to change their boiler. But, you know, the other heating measures are a step too far for an awful lot of people. And I'm just looking, is, is that something you could, you could discuss? Thank you. Thank you very much. Who would like to come in on that? So I think, uh, I think, uh, I mean, we did. We did. We have discussed some of these these the, yeah. these issues. So apologies for uh, yeah, going, apologies, going over so, again yeah. the ground. Like in terms of the the, the insulation, there is a, a big question about you know do people face the right incentives to insulate? The hassle factor, you know, yeah. true from a constituents, they just you know there's a lot of hassle involved in doing it. And what are the barriers there? And then there's the financial issue. So maybe a household thinks a very strong incentive to wet or fit in terms of the reduction in their energy bills, but they don't have access to the financing. And maybe that's a role for SEI. And we spoke earlier about potential low cost, low cost loans. So I think there are, there's both incentives, there's the, the hassle factor, and then there's the funding, the different issues which might prevent uh, people from, from insulating. But as, as we discussed, and as you're aware, enormous challenge yeah. to, to, to uh, it's going to take a generation to retrofit uh, homes. It is interesting the different types of options that, 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 that people go with. And I know SEI are doing a lot of work in trying to figure out what's working, what's not, why is the take up the variability of the take-up and the take-up by different income groups and what's, what's causing that. So there's a lot of work uh, and that will feed into policy in the future. In relation to, to climate change, I think we did set out that there are, that there are governance challenges, the principal agent problem that, that, that we face on the country's face here, that the Minister is responsible for delivering the targets, but of course the levers are with a whole variety of other departments and agencies and uh, trying to have that coordinated approach is the job of, of, of the Department of Climate. But, you know, there is an issue about through which mechanisms there's a cabinet committee on climate change and senior officials group but are they operating the best and can they do do a different so we've an open mind on that okay. i think i did mention in my remarks about some countries they have mandated targets so uh, sector x is mandated to deliver on that target and that's driven from the center uh, and there are other different but you know i think i think uh, this is something that we will have to look at and that you know we've an open mind on, on the approach but certainly i think there are, there are ways that we can improve the coordination challenge that exists thank you Thank you. Thank you very much. I might move on to Deputy Sherlock. Thank you very much, and, and I apologise. Wednesdays <laughs> we're flitting in and out of committee rooms, so I apologise if I'm going to repeat that which has been, you know, said or asked uh, before. The, uh, this is all about behavioural change, and the Citizens' Assembly, in one of their recommendations, sought the establishment of a, an independent body, an oversight body, if you will. And in some of the language that Mr. Watt uses here today, there is the, the language of, you know, considering what structures, you know, might be necessary. Is there an articulation of that vision across government about what type of structure could be created or, is, or, or, or would it continue to be housed in a particular department looking across other departmental silos, if you will? Do we need an overarching structure that would actually, you know, benchmark the actions of individual departments? Because I, I take some solace from the two interventions that we've had here today. I, I, I take some solace from the fact that there is a, a clear outlining of a, a vision, if you will, in respect of what needs to be done and the urgency of the problem. I'd be very frank and say that I think it's the first articulation that I've heard from a government department or two government departments in respect of, of the urgency of this. But it, it, I, I'm trying to deconstruct some of the language and some of the language sometimes, if I, and I don't mean this in a pejorative sense, can be a little bit coded. We use language like more stringent central mandates, you know, you know, we, we, we least cost abatement options. And, and there is a language around this that needs to be de deconstructed and simplified if we are to do a, a, a fit for purpose report that reflects the citizen assembly report. So I, I just want to see, my very simple question is, 
Citizens' Assembly, they make a recommendation in relation to the establishment of a central independent body. Are we moving towards a similar type of structure across government that would you know, kick the tyres on what individual departments are doing? Are you saying that it wouldn't be independent? We've already had this question but, asked. Or, oh, forgive me, yes. Yeah, but no, in, in, in relation to an independent body and how that would work, are you talking about cross-governmental? Are, are you talking about the Iraq that's doing it? Is that your question here as opposed well, to... Well, forgive me if I'm, if I'm not clear. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm really trying to maybe tease out what it is that Robert yeah. is saying in relation to the structures that are necessary. Okay. Um, and are they... A, a, Interdepartmental, or, or do they supersede? Is it an outside independent? So I don't. I don't believe an external body is the way to go. I think that's okay. a bit of a cop out, right? Okay. That's very clear enough language, deputy. Thank you. I think that's a cop out. Appreciate that's that. That's a mistake. Okay. I, I, that's not going to get it done. Uh, there's only so much that we can say. It's not our job to decide the responsibilities of government departments. That's the job of the Taoiseach. So there's only so much that we can say. It's not for me to say. Uh, the ultimately in, a, in, in any system. Does Minister X pay much attention to Minister Y? So you know this, definitely from your time with us, different guys. I, I, I'm loving this frankness from the so, Secretary General. So, so Would that which, all Secretaries so which, General could be so, so frank? <laughs> so which, which, uh, which minister does all ministers, which two people in government do all ministers take notice of? Right? It's the minister who controls the money and the person who does the, the firing and the hiring. Okay? Is that how it works? Is that too oblique for you? That's well, that's fine. So, so, and, and, and so thank that, you. That's, so that's I, clear. I, I, look, how I'm many minutes gonna, have I left in so, my slot? <laughs> I'm not going to get into this. This is not for. This is for off the clock. This is this is you know always very very wary. You I get a text from some advisor saying mm, I was watching that clip of you and the as we go on. But I think but I think it's but I think it's cleared up, deputy. Like as much as myself and Derek are constrained here, we're in terms of what we can say. But I think it's clear enough that. That's how that's how government works, okay? okay. And it's. Uh, but so, so, what about the mechanisms then? We'll say thoughts. Your thoughts then on the mechanisms for introducing carbon budgets, for instance, like. Uh, yeah, like I, I, I think if car, if a carbon budget can lead to better decision making, but I don't really think that's the most important thing I'd be focusing okay. on. I'd be focusing on what are the measures, the structures. What are the measures? How do we have structures which ensure those right measures are brought forward, and how do we ensure they're implemented? I'm not really sure a carbon budget. Uh, like I thought, I'm always sceptical of when we say the budget is a, it's a housing budget or it's a health budget or it's a, you know, like, uh, what, did, what does it mean in reality? Now, can, does it make sense for us to try each year collate the measures that are trying to help us? Or try, yes. Okay, fine. And we're doing a bit of that, that work. So you could say within the budget there's spending elements, deputy, that are related to carbon or climate <laughs> and there's tax measures, so you can do it in that sense. But I, I wouldn't be spending too much time worrying about that. I think it's the, the, it's the policies, the structures, the mandate, the implementation. How, how does it actually get done? They're the things that I would focus on. You see, if, if we're talking about reaching targets and, you know, already we're surpassing the, you know, like 5% reduction in emissions yeah. each year between now and 2020 or 2050, and so there's already clearly defined targets. And it's a case of, again, to try and help us make the best report that we can possibly make, it's, it's where does government map onto that? Yeah. And, 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 you know, that's why so I let's the say, question. let's say you have to reduce emissions next year by a million. So let's say you agree that, essentially. Then the, the next question is, which of the sectors actually has to, how do you burden share that? How do you share that out amongst the different sectors? Yeah. So you can do that pro rata, or you can do it relative to the cost of abatement. The cost of abatement is the more efficient way, but let's say that's too difficult. Let's say you then say, okay, agriculture is responsible for 40% of emissions, whatever. They should reduce by 400,000. So, that, so that's the way you could do it. Now, of course, then you have to. That's, but that's 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 just setting the top-down target. And the next question is, how are we going to get there? What options, measures do you have to get there? And then how do you enforce them? So that's the different levels I would try to think about the, the challenge. Okay. Thank you. Aidan, do you want? Are you ready? I know you're just in the door there. You're at another <laughs> committee. I know that. <laughs> if you are ready to ask a question, I will, I will take my opportunity. Yeah. Never let me said. So uh, I was liaising with some of my colleagues to, um, about to try and avoid uh, some crossover uh, that there had been earlier and thank the officials for coming in and sorry I missed some of the uh, earlier points we were in talking heritage next door which is uh, important too but um, can I ask uh, of the, in the Department of 
finance officials, um, are there any plans for the long-term macro analysis of the tax system, uh, looking at stabilisation of the system in the context of using tax to enable the low-carbon transition? Um, for example, around the timing of moving away from the current position of taxing fossil fuels heavily and not taxing electrical vehicles towards gradually taxing EVs as tax revenues from fossil fuels go down. Obviously, you know, the, the, the revenue we get at the minute from uh, fuel is very significant and how would that impact? And also, um, has the department considered introducing um, a carbon price floor for electricity as is used in the UK? Um, we want, uh, you want to do those two for okay? financing? Yeah. Do, do you like to in on this? Mr. Moran? Um, on, on, on the carbon, we've already spoken about it in terms of the development of pathway out over, over the next um, eight to ten years and, 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 and the importance of that. I've referred to this, the type of research that we've done, which suggests there is a, 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 a potential important return for carbon tax increases in terms of um, re reduction of emissions. And um, um, it, it, this is something that is, is it, it needs to be done. We need to have that trajectory going forward. And as I say, follow-up research, the stuff that we've published is about, is, is looking at what that pathway might look like and look at the implications and the mitigations that might have to go with that. So we have that. In terms of electricity, Robert, I, I... So, I think under the new ETS, uh, uh, Deputy, there will be a floor under the price of the new ETS scheme that comes in from 2020. Uh, there obviously it wasn't a floor under the existing scheme. Or maybe it's the UK scheme I'm confusing it with. The, the, the UK, UK, have an ETS. UK has a floor, yeah. but I don't think there is uh, in relation to the But that's, that's, uh, that's an important issue because what happened during this cur the current phase was that there was such, such a supply of allowance that the, the price, uh, that the price collapsed. But I think under future, and given the target is, is so difficult and given we are going to be seeing significant reductions in emissions and therefore allowance in the ETS. I think there will be a credible price sustained during the period. Uh, and since a lot, sorry, Ken, since a lot of the cheaper abatement options have been pursued uh, within a number of those sectors, I think we will see we will see a higher price uh, uh, ETS. In this Mr. Period. McCarthy, did you want to come in? On this? Just very briefly, uh, Just within the the ETS sectors, I mean, one of the the flaws of the of the scheme has been uh, that because of the collapse in, in the European economy post the crisis in in 2008 2009, uh, you saw an excess supply of credits, and hence the, the the price of of carbon fell. I think there's something like five euros per ton or something like that within the uh, within the ETS, uh, and hence you did have an argument that was made by, by uh, some economists that maybe a floor should be introduced. Uh, but what we've seen over the past 12 months or so is the, and, and I wouldn't be, I'm not an expert in this area, but what you've seen is, is a move by the European authorities to, to mop up some of the excess supply of credits. And as a result, the, the price of carbon per tonne has moved from about five euros per tonne to over 20 euros per tonne. Uh, just one follow-up point on, on the carbon tax, and, and you mentioned the sort of economic trajectory and so forth. Uh, just one point that, that's worth mentioning, and that's the kind of OECD hierarchy of taxes. Um, the OECD and I suppose the IMF and, and others would tend to, to point to uh, you tax bads, not goods. Uh, you know, you tax bad outcomes like you know negative externalities and so forth. And we've done some modelling which shows that if you increase a carbon tax and use the proceeds to reduce, for instance, labour tax. It's win-win for the economy because you know reducing the tax burden on labour is, is positive in terms of labour supply, the potential growth, and so forth. Uh, so that's something we're conscious of when we provide our analysis. As, as Robert said, we don't make the decisions, but we provide the analysis to the minister. Okay, okay that's helpful. Yeah, I just have a couple of questions then for on the public expenditure side, even more so. Um, that how can we ensure governments? government departments, climate-proof major actions and investment projects, and in particular, you know, mindful uh, Project Ireland 2040, I think Mr. Watts, your uh, co-chair of the uh, delivery board, D the carbon impact of the National Development Plan, you know, how much is that factored in? Um, and obviously, being in control of purse strings means you have a lot of influence in, in determining if departments aren't considering it enough uh, that we encourage them to do so. And are, are there plans for uh, cross-departmental spending programs on climate action? And, um, you know, personally, I think that would make a lot of sense. And just wonder if there are plans for that. Thanks, Deputy. So in relation to 
uh, the, the appraisal. So we've, we're, we're in the process now of revising the guidelines, uh, which sets out what the price of carbon, the, the imputed price of carbon that should be used, the shadow price, when it comes to investment decisions. So uh, we set out in, our, in our, our draft consultation, which is out there now for discussion, uh, what the price should be in the future. So that, that will uh, incentivise projects that have a significant abatement potential and discourage investments that, that lead to, to higher emissions. And that's the main way through which we're going to be influencing decisions over time, so that, that departments, when they're making decisions about investment, will reflect a, a, higher, a higher price for carbon. In terms of cross-departmental, there's a variety of spending initiatives that are assigned to different departments. Uh, some of them work together in a collaborative sense, uh, but departments have responsibility for their programmes, and within that there, there are elements of them that are related to, that are related to climate. Uh, and we do publish, we do, I think we mentioned this in the context of the, the carbon budget, we do pull together the different strands of spending that's related to carbon, uh, and we set out the, the measures. And I think, you know, it's around public transport, it's around energy efficiency, retrofitting, this all sort of the, sta the standard the standard type of options uh, and measures in relation to the ETS scheme in, in, in regard to uh, renewables, supports for renewables, and so on. So there's a variety of, of initiatives. Uh, so there is cross-departmental... And, yep. and then just finally, kind of follow on from the first part of it, might even touch on earlier, but have you analysed carbon impact of the National Development Plan? Or? So, we, we, ha we haven't gone through the, 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 the plan in its entirety, and there's a variety of different work streams which are establishing what the, the, the benefits would be of different, different streams that's been worked on. So, hopefully, during next year, there'll be more detail on that available from, from the department. It's an ongoing process. Yeah. I'm going to bring in Deputy Mulhern. Um, yeah. Did you want to come in? Yeah, sorry, Deputy Ryan, can um, I, is okay? Deputy, yeah. No, just because it follows on. Um, yeah. Can I just say the general um, approach I think we need to take is that this country really turns and changes when we're all working in a certain direction. We need to triple the level of ambition of our climate action in the same way we've just tripled the price for carbon in our public procurement assessment in the political system. And I think we need to triple our level of investment in this issue in our public administrative system. And if we do that together, collectively, we can turn things around in this country. We're showing we're good at it. Uh, I suppose the first question I have, if, you, if I can, uh, Chairman, is, Mr. Watt, Mr. Watt, Rob, Robert, what is your role, what's the role of your department in the assessment or the drafting of the new Energy and Climate Action Plan that we have to do under EU governance? So that's led by, that's led by uh, the Department, Department of Climate. Uh, so we will be involved with them in helping them assessing the options uh, based on the public spending code, the options that we believe will deliver abatement at the lowest cost. So we will be engaged in, in conversations and discussions. And I think one of the challenges we have, Deputy, is to actually beef up the capacity. I think you're aware of the IGES work that we've been doing, the papers that we've been publishing, which tries to improve our analytical capacity. And that's what it comes down to. There are lots of options out there. And people talk about, you know, that option will, will lead to emissions reductions. And when you actually investigate it, it doesn't deliver or it's too expensive. So what will actually work? What will actually make an impact? So our role, Deputy, will be involved with we're working with the department in assessing options that come from them and from the other, the other options and engaging, hopefully, in a, in a constructive discussion about uh, those options that should be put to government then for decision. You said earlier on correctly that we know already now that there's at least a 100 million tonne gap in what we need to do in the next decade, the next 12 years, and the potential cost of not closing that gap is at least 3.2 billion, could be up to 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 billion, depending on the price of carbon. Have you seen in that role you have, that responsibility you have to assess the options of how you close the gap, have you, seen from, have you received from the other department details of what those options might be? No. So the work, the work, so so first of all, I didn't say that it would be three billion or six billion. Whichever. I, yeah. Okay. Just clarifying that. My nice headline. Uh, I didn't say that, but I said it will be. There's 100 million, and we likely don't know what the price. three plus. We don't know what the price is. Uh, but no, we, we, I think, and I think you've, you've got this from your discussions already with Secretary General that we don't have the options worked through. We don't have all the options worked through that, that, that establish what, what are what are the decisions we have to take uh, in this area. We've got some ideas, of course. We've got. The, the project 2040, which have ideas, we've got views about carbon tax and future pricing, but we don't have the full the full suite uh, of measures. And that work is that work is ongoing. And before that's the key you, challenge that we face. Before you came in, and this is working in a collaborative way, and I'm not trying to be smart. We made a decision here as a committee that we were going to write to all the Secretary Generals and in, to help our work 
and acknowledging that the government and the state has to have its first draft answer to that question by Christmas. Mm -hmm. So to assist us in work, we were going to write to all the Secretary Generals to say, could you by the 30th of November provide us what options are on the table in your mind and how much carbon abatement they would be and what sort of timelines would they be? Because that would assist us, Minister Bruton's coming in, I think, on the 5th of December. Could you, because you have that coordinating central role, make sure that the other departments, and indeed your own, provide this committee with that sort of detailed options paper for the 30th of November? Yeah, I don't know whether they'll have it ready by then, but I know the work is ongoing. Uh, we'll Given see we have what to do this on. for Europe for Christmas, and we've known for three years the European Government's package was agreed by Government in October 2014, and I've seen the departments, both departments, I've seen you work up close, uh, providing analysis in a really heroic way and short timelines. I'm saying we need that sort of level of ambition and heroic endeavour here so that by the 30th of November, so that in advance of Christmas, it's not that far away Christmas, we can look at some of the options. If we could commit to that. Can I say just one other question? The National Development Plan, we know already from the modelling that's been done, doesn't close the gap. In fact, everything it does, in my mind, or a lot of what it does, takes us in the wrong direction, or it doesn't take us far enough. If I can just a couple of examples. We've heard here about the importance of retrofitting, and it's a brilliant investment. It's the lowest cost abatement curve. I can tell you in advance there's endless amount of reports I could wheel out to show retrofitting of energy efficiency buildings is the lowest cost of carbon. We have a four billion figure in the, in the budget for that. Andrew McDowell, the head of the EIB, was in Dublin last week saying it's a 50 billion budget that we need. John Fitzgerald said, was here saying for the social housing alone, we had a five billion budget. The OPW were saying here, we're nowhere near meeting our energy efficiency targets in public buildings and the sort of numbers that were mentioned here in your presentation today aren't even are a minute percentage of what we should be doing. So that four billion figure ain't gonna be enough. We're gonna to have to change the national development plan. Similarly, in transport, I have to say to you, I'm speaking maybe as a Dublin person here, what's going on in transport is an absolute crime. It's a continuation, Mr. Watt, of what you said about our sprawl, because in Dublin, we're widening the N11, widening the N7, widening the N6, widening the N4, widening the N3, widening the N2. What you said absolutely correctly, that our big problem is the sprawl model. The National Planning Framework said the right thing, we're going to move away from it. The National Development Plan forgot that, threw it out. The only thing we're building this year are roads. We've no public transport project been built. We've not a single cycling project been built. Same again next year. It has to change. Similarly, there's nothing about forestry in the National Development Plan. Similarly, there's nothing about new circular economy in the National Development Plan. Do you agree that if we're going to be serious about this climate task we have, that the National Development Plan is going to have to change? So I, I don't agree with the, the characterisation of the plan in relation to uh, public transport. I think there are significant investments there planned in relation to bus connect, cycleways, uh, the metro. Uh, and as you know, Deputy, within Dublin, it's about the future planning of the Dublin that we have, uh, a model of development of unplanned urban sprawl, which is not sustainable. It's not sustainable from a congestion perspective or, or, or climate perspective, and that needs to change. And I think a very significant development over the last number of months is the Land Development Agency, where the government sets out its plans to, to enable much more compact development. And I think a key part of Project 2040 is that there is an alignment between a spatial view, a land view of the country, and the capital plan. And I do believe they're, uh, they do believe they're aligned. Of course, we can do more, and we shall see as the, as the plan has been implemented uh, how we can support the objectives of having a much more compact city. If In relation to retrofitting, uh, the plan sets out uh, a significant investment programme which is a start, which is on its way, uh, and we shall see. Nobody would underestimate or downplay the enormous challenge we have in terms of retrofitting. I think 88% of our houses were built before uh, we had the energy, the, the, the rating system in place. Uh, we have got significant challenges and the costs, the costs are there. We discussed them already today about the cost of different installations and different options. How we fund this? will be a mix of uh, tax incentives, uh, tax increases to incentivise people to take the retrofitting, uh, direct exchequer grants, uh, loan guarantees, low cost funding, a variety of, a variety of different options. Uh, and there's no doubt that as we start this retrofitting programme and as we see how we're going, uh, that we have to look at other, other instruments, other mechanisms to accelerate the progress. If, if I but I don't, but I don't, I don't think, like for a plan, a plan 
my view is that the Project 2040 is, is the right plan in terms of the ambition, uh, the types of initiatives. There's a strong focus on compact cities, and it's a question of us actually delivering on that. And if I think that's a big change, Deputy, from where if we were before. If I was if, if I, two, yeah. two other questions. Really if I was a government tomorrow, I'd be switching all that road spending, widening the roads to Dublin, which is going to make the more difficult task for bus connects and yeah. spending on that public transport. And if I was, I'd also be commissioning Bordemona to lead out and go out buy, get them to buy 10,000 heat pumps so we get a better price and a whole uh, apprenticeship for young people in the Midlands to, to start retrofitting a house. But can I ask two other questions if I can, Sharon? Firstly, I agree with you with the governance issue. Um, I think it has to belong to the centre of the state. You can't tell the government or you can't tell what to do. Although the wording in the uh, Citizens' Assembly was saying, not just new, but it said, or else improve or resource the existing independent bodies. So I would resource the Climate Advisory Committee more. I would have a Just Transition Commission. I would have a Green Investment Bank. I would, there's loads of ways you can do it. But I believe you're right. The centre has to be where this responsibility lies. Would, and we made this submission in our submission to the consultation paper on Monday. Should we not change the delivery board to being a climate action delivery board? Should we not get Mark Griffin in as co-chair with you and recognise that we put climate at the centre of our whole decision-making process? And it's that body has a responsibility because that's where the power lies, working with other departments. Would you make that change in and the government structure? And your second question as well, Deputy. Just uh, if you can second, back. Okay, second question is, I would ask Mr Moran, <clears throat> if you could by the 30th of November in the same way I've asked Mr. Watt, to come back to this committee with an analysis of how we would introduce a cap and dividend scheme on the additional carbon tax that we would rise. Assuming that we would put another 20 euro carbon tax in the existing way we have of charging it, but that we would, we would return the revenue to the citizens in just the way that Senator uh, O'Sullivan has set out. Could you, and if, if you have to get the ESRI to do it with you, fine, but could you do a paper to assist us in our writing our paper on, how, on the implications, costs, opportunities, obstacles in that process. Thank you. I might bring in Mr Watt first. Yep, I don't disagree with you on the heat pumps or the, 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 the widening the roads either. Uh, in relation to the, 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 the question, uh, yeah, like it, it, it might be a, a structural change is to have uh, the SecGen group uh, chaired by Mark who, who takes that responsibility. Yeah, that, that, might, that might be uh, something which is uh, comparable to the governance structure we have in for the delivery board. Yeah. No, that, they don't replace the delivery board. Ah, replace the delivery board. Like the, uh, the minister says he wants a job action plan type thing. Well, that should be the job action plan centre of it. Mm. Um, Mr. Moran. Let me see what we can do. Um, I think you referred to our heroic efforts in the past. See if we can... I've seen it, and, and you can do it. I, I faith. Can I last one last point? Just comment toward the question. Brief, brief, brief. The, brief, briefly. Mr. Watt is right in terms of it's still political responsibilities where the responsibility lies in the end, and, and so we have a responsibility. But it's interesting when you cited examples. You cited ministers Howland, Noonan, and O'Donoghue, three finance ministers. Everyone knows who's been in government that the reality is that's where the power is. And you as an energy or as an agriculture or as a transport minister have to get over that obstacle. And it has been an obstacle in getting to decarbonisation. There was always a sense that you were fighting, that they didn't quite understand in the Department of Finance and Public Expenditure and Reform that decarbonisation is actually an economic opportunity for this country, that we can and will be good at it, that this is where the new economy is going, that retrofitting is not a burden, it's not a high risk. But that has to change. That we have to give power to some of the line ministers and indeed local authorities and mayors so that everyone in this country gets the chance to experiment and show off how we can actually make this shift. Well, That's one briefly, of the changes that has to happen. I was, it was referring to uh, Deputy, Deputy Pringle's suggestion that perhaps there were civil servants around the country. That's what I was suggesting that uh, Deputies Howland and Noon should be brought in to, to give their view on that. Uh, but seriously, in relation to, I don't disagree on the opportunities. I don't disagree with that at all, and uh, I think from the contributions we made this afternoon, I think you probably got a sense that we believe we believe the urgency of this challenge and the scale of this challenge, and it is it's going to involve an enormous uh, change to our society, and that will provide enormous opportunities. It will involve difficult decisions, and it will involve some sectors that will will go into decline, but there will be other sectors that will grow and prosper, and I don't I don't see it. Uh, at all just negatively. I see quite the opposite. I think there will be great opportunities, but it will involve, uh, it will involve 
the, the, the pain of transition. And I think we need to be upfront about some of those issues, and we shouldn't, be, we shouldn't duck them. But I, I, but I don't see it, I don't see it as a, entirely as negative. I think it's an, it's an opportunity for future sectors to grow and prosper and provide employment. Mr so Moran, briefly. Yeah. To very briefly, yeah. I do agree with the mm -hmm. urgency of this, and um, we, we need to move on. We made certain progress around, and in particular, to about um, um, things like carbon tax and, 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 and the carbonisation of, of how we treat it, um, um, vehicle registration, some time ago. But we need to move forward from that. We've been sort of stuck. Yeah, thank you. Senator Mulhern. Thank you. Um, Mr Watt, you talked about the pain of transition, which is clear, and we, we, all, we need to know the cost. And I think you, uh, you emphasised that a lot in your presentation, that we need to know, uh, are we going to achieve an objective, which is to reduce carbon emissions, and what is the cost? And at every stage, that's what we need to do here, because the boat has to be able to float in the end as well as us building it. So whatever we do here in a report, has to, we have to try and get something that, that, that we can aim towards that will work. I'm just wondering, aside from the pain side um, and hitting targets and reducing uh, carbon emissions and that, have we a an overall view going forward of what our economy and our lifestyles are going to look like in terms of, for example, you know, in, your f in forecasting, and Mr. Moran as well, in economic forecasting, growth areas, and you know, in general, like lifestyles, for instance, are we going to ultimately, as a consumer, end up having cheaper electricity? You know, things like this. Uh, are we going to embark on a crusade of innovation and research, and you know, have the intellectual property to the new technology solutions to displace fossil fuels? That that we are leaders. And aside from the generality of what I've sa just said, like. How specifically is this being looked at from the point of view, I suppose, Department of Finance in terms of looking at as an area where we can actually glean some benefits in the longer term economically and it's not just about, you know, the, the, these are things that you can encourage business and, uh, you know, people who are the innovators and that they know that we're going to prioritise our spending on people who have uh, these sort of ideas and that we'll have a whole new economy. Uh, not just... Senator, yeah, yes, first. sorry, thank you. Who wants to come in? Mr. Moran? Uh, just, 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 just briefly, I mean, I think there is this cycle, I mean, um, economic growth on itself without being um, um, moderated in, it leads to increased emissions and we've seen that over the last period of time and it's to try to get to this sort of conceptual idea of, of, of putting growth on a much more environmentally sustainable, sustainable path and I know that's very strongly the sort of message that comes out of the likes of the OECD that this is where countries should be going. I don't know, John, if you want to yeah, I mean, just very briefly to, to add to that, I mean, the, the focus at a European level, at an OECD level, uh, the likes of the IMF and so forth, it has moved away from just looking at uh, GDP as a measure of our sort of living standards and so forth. It tends to complement, the indicators tend to complement GDP with uh, fiscal sustainability measures, environmental sustainability measures, inclusiveness and so forth. And there's a whole uh, work stream at a European level and in Eurostat looking at some of these issues. And every two years we get together with the, with the OECD and do a report on the economy and look at it on <coughs> sustainability more widely defined than just simply GDP. So it is, it is an area that a lot, of, a lot of work is being done on, both in the department and internationally. Okay, Mr. Watt. Like I, I, I think, uh, I don't know what the future is going to be. They never make forecasts, especially about the future, as they say. Uh, but I suspect it's going to be very, very different in terms of, in terms of, well, I think, yeah. I'll give you a vision, I think. I think how we how we uh, heat our homes, how we uh, transport ourselves, what we eat, I think will be very different in the future. And I think the big system change, as I mentioned earlier, is that we will have an electricity system which is decarbonised and we will have uh, heat and transport uh, electrified uh, to a very significant extent. And I think uh, the, battery, uh, the battery and changes in terms of the cost of battery and power, I think the battery will, uh, will, change, will change our society in, uh, in fundamental ways. Uh, I think you'll see it maybe 10, 15 years. You'll see I think electric cars, uh, I think Derek mentioned there are 4,000 electric cars. I think these numbers are going to increase very dramatically as uh, the cost of batteries fall. I think we're already seeing it. I think some studies suggesting that uh, even the absence of subsidies that electric cars could be, could be cheaper than fossil fuel combustion engines in, in three, four, five years. So there's going to be dramatic, dramatic uh, changes. Exactly who knows, but I think 
Yeah, I just want on the on the issue of battery cars, um, electric vehicles. How many kilometres would you have to drive, for example, to uh, you know taking on board the, the, the carbon footprint from manufacturing process? And how, how many kilometres would you have to drive to actually? Uh, recharge your car again? Not, not recharge. The range? Are we range anxiety? That's no, that, huh? no, not that. But in terms of comparing it with the whole process that's involved, say in a diesel engine, and you manufacture it, and you you go out and you drive, and we know mm. it's we know the cheaper side of it, and yeah. it's it's more of a mainstream uh, technology. Uh, people buy them, etc. Like you know, uh, what distances do you need to be driving these electric vehicles? Compared to diesel cars, for you know, for them to be beneficial to the objectives that we're seeking to achieve. Yeah. I, is that something from your department, or is that a? It's probably for the Department of Transport. Transport uh, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. We'll try and get the answer. Uh, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a there's an answer to that question. Yeah. But uh, like you know the, the the issue the issue about the electric cars in terms of the range anxiety, which is about 320k, I think they can go without being recharged. It depends on the latest yeah. the latest Tesla go far expensive though. But the issue is about the price of batteries, which is coming down. Yeah. It's coming down, even in the absence of the subsidy the Department of Finance provides, that uh, there are very significant falls in, in, in the cost of batteries and very significant improvements in the power of batteries. And that would be the, the big thing that drives the, uh, drives the change. But it, of course, it only works, and we haven't really talked about it, it only works if the electricity system is fundamentally different and it's more decarbonised. And that is, that is another challenge that I'm sure the Department of Climate can talk to you about. Thank you. For, um, Deputy Stanley. Uh, thanks. Um, the, um, the whole issue of EVs uh, started to put around that subject. Just in terms of the, the charging infrastructure, uh, at the moment the regulator has said that uh, DS must be moved from DSP. ESP has been providing it uh, free, free of charge, and obviously that won't go on forever. Um, so that needs to uh, move ahead, if you like, of the uh, of the take up of of. Uh, EVs, because if the charging infrastructure isn't there, and it, while we do have some at the moment, it's thin on the ground. You know that, you know, there's places where you'll have one in a major town of maybe 20,000 people um, at, at, a, at, a, at a railway station or something like that. But, but uh, you know, there will be need maybe for five or six or seven. Uh, and just, you know, what uh, what's the view of the Department of Finance on that? Um, we try to get the views of your minister on it. Um, the other question, I'll take the four questions, will I? Yes. yes. In relation to renewable energy, um, like obviously, you know, we have huge potential here in terms of, in terms of wind and wave uh, and even solar and other forms, you know, biomass, biogas um, <clears throat> and did hydro. Uh, but the Climate Action Fund of 500 million over 10 years, 50 million, that doesn't reflect it, uh, that, we're, that we're making this a huge priority. And you know, I note that in the, you know, the national development plan, that it, 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 it there's 116 uh, billion program uh, underpinning that, uh, and you know, there's um, there's 7.6 exchequer and 14.2 billion non exchequer, and you might just tell me where the 14.2 non exchequer is coming from, uh, but you know, out of that, uh, 50 million a year is. You know, while it's well, a welcome move that we're starting to do it, it does seem the fact that it doesn't escalate from 50 million as we move on through the 20s, you know, between, uh, between 2020 and 2030, wouldn't give you hope that, you know, that anything that will be any significant change there as a result of that fund. Um, and, you know, in what's I suppose pertinent here is, is that if you take the case of just Board Namona and their transition uh, from, from, from brown to green. Uh, and we've had that discussion here yesterday with Board One again. Um, and obviously, you know, in the where like, neck of the woods I live in, and the constituency represent is a huge concern to us. Um, just in relation to that, um, you know, moving from, moving from green to brown, you know, obviously there's a huge area there for investment. Uh, you know, do you see, does your department see that, that uh, you know, that Board One would need a piece of that, a significant piece of that, maybe to help them with that transition? And the other question, just in relation to, in relation to funding for that transition, the 105 million, uh, roughly, on that's on the PSO uh, subsidy for Peter at the moment. Uh, you know, is it possible within the rules of the department and the European Union for for that or part of that to be used 
uh, to make the trans you know to help towards that transition as well. Okay. Um, so, you know, the climate action fund of 50 million per year um, doesn't seem to escalate as it, you know, as we move on over the next uh, decade or uh, decade and a half. The you know part of the PSO levy could that be brought into play? Um, the the other one I wanted to ask you about was uh, I just say you know around this disruptive technology fund of 500 million. Um, what's that? Where is it coming from? What can it be used for? If it's disruptive technology, do I take it that it means moving from one technology to another? You know, could the likes of Board Namona and ESP use that type of uh, funding uh, that you might deal you with might that? Start them but I suppose overall, what I'm trying to get to is, is that you know we have a lot of bits and pieces happening around the place. And uh, somebody onto me today about you know about solar power. Even you know, leaders seem to be handling some funding for it. You know, SEAI seem to have you know other pieces of grants. And there's just the public out there get, uh, I suppose, pardon the pun, find it very hard to get plugged into all of this in terms of, you know, what's available. And there's a public representative that follows it, I do, right, in terms of what's available, how to access it. Um, there, there seems to be, there's little initiatives announced every now and then, yeah. Yeah. presumably drafted up by yourselves, yeah. and the minister comes out and announces it. Yeah. But the minister yeah. should really be in charge. Um, okay. and I, I, might I don't put know that how that works for doing it, might, but that is a real issue. Okay, thank you. I'll let, you, let you in on those as you wish. To. There's a number of questions there. I don't need to repeat them. I think yeah. they're well uh, outlined. I, I think, yeah. thanks definitely for the questions, and I think they're, they're valid. Yeah. I think most of the issues in relation to SEIA in terms of schemes is for, it's for the department and for the authority. It's not for, it's not for, for us. Our remit doesn't extend in terms of, of um, publicising the benefits of schemes or, 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 or that, that's for the, the different agencies. But just, just, to, just to general comments you mentioned about the funds. So the funds are, are what, what the, the, the minister of the government decided was that it would be very useful rather than money being allocated to the departments to actually allocate to a fund and encourage then different players in the system, outside the system, to come forward with ideas. And there's fund in relation to the sub technology, which could be anything, it could be climate related, but it could be, it could be outside the climate uh, field. And then there's a direct fund then in relation to climate initiatives. And, we have received lots of uh, submissions, uh, and those ideas are now being looked through, and they're being evaluated, and they're being assessed. And the government will make some announcements uh, over the next the period ahead in relation to those. So we'll see how we'll see how we get on with these funds. Like it's something which we're uh, interested in because it creates that that competitive tension and it encourages innovation across the system. Uh, what they'll actually fund at this stage, we don't know, but we'll make an announcement shortly in relation to the question of renewables. Uh, I could be mistaken, I can might know, but renewables now make up, depending on which, which, which time of the day or which time of the year, make up about 40%, can make up about 40% of, of peak demand for electricity. So that's a pretty significant, when, when Minister Ryan was there, it was only, it was only 15, 20%, I think, uh, when Neil was there. You know, that's not too long ago. That was the fault of Greens. Yeah. Well, on certain days, on certain days, like if, it's, if, it gets, if it gets very windy and it's cold, uh, uh, there's a lot of time it's uh, it's very windy, and it's uh, it's uh, you know there isn't demand there for it. But when you know there are times when when the renewables can contribute a lot to the the, the, the grid, uh, and most of that's most of that's onshore wind. There's an issue about other renewables, other sources of renewables, the extent to which they will compete. Onshore is the cheapest. Uh, offshore, I think, is much more expensive. The last numbers I saw, what impact significant impact solar will have in Ireland? Never really been convinced that solar is going to make a big impact. But again, I'm not. The expert here that there are others yeah, who are experts this last night as well yeah others might, might, might have might have known more about it yeah. than <clears throat> think guess solar works yeah. in hotter climates where where the solar panels then then uh, generate electricity for the air conditioning systems uh, i guess when it's uh, nice and sunny here it's not too cold uh, or there isn't that demand for electricity so it depends it depends but i think the renewables is a, is a positive story and if you think about uh, how renewables penetration in the electricity system has evolved over the last five ten years it's a very significant change and it does, Sorry. It, does, it does show, I think, as uh, Deputy Ryan mentioned earlier, that when the system can get galvanised, we can actually deliver, and uh, very significantly. There are big issues in relation to peat extraction, Deputy, which you know more about than I would, I, I suspect, and then in relation to a money point, what happens, uh, what happens there. In, in relation to the PSO, to the, the PSO, the PSO uh, so the PSO is what is levied on consumers to pay for the higher costs of, of uh, electricity related to peat extraction because it's inefficient compared to uh, 
other forms. Uh, that's levied on people, so I think that would require the European Commission, I think, to, to consider how that would operate uh, in the future, the absence of, of peat, uh, peat extraction. But it's a charge which is currently levied on households, uh, and that would obviously, uh, household bills, I think everything else but eco will be lower in the future as we move to, to a different, uh, different form of fuel mix without, without peat. So there's a potential saving there, and there's potential, uh, potential sums involved. Uh, in terms of the final, I think the first, the first point you made about charging points, I think is a, is a, uh, it's an interesting one, and that's part of the public infrastructure that we're going to have to improve. And if we're going to have a significant num increase in the number of electric vehicles, well, then there's going to have to be more charging points uh, around the country. But the range anxiety issue will be in two ways. One yeah. is the car manufacturers extend the distance that you can go on the battery. Yeah. And there obviously is a lot of research, the big car companies are doing a lot of research on that. Yeah. But the, other, the only other thing we can do is, is that in the interim, is that there is more charging points. Yeah. But even if it is extended, we're going to need a significant number of, you know, uh, in every parish, in every yeah. Oh, yeah. village, you know. Yeah, but if you look, I don't know how many, how many garages there are in Ireland. You know, if you take that as a, as a, a rough uh, proxy for, for how many initial charging points, you know, you'd have a good idea of the numbers in the future that we'll actually need. I'm sure but in terms of the funding this. of it, is the question I'm asking you directly as Department of Finance. The ESB has been carrying this, right? Yeah. The, the Department of Communications, Climate Action and Environment will come to you guys, right? Have you had discussions with the Department of Climate Action, or Department of Communications, Climate Action and Environment in relation to this specific matter? No, we haven't. No. There hasn't been. I haven't. No. Any kind of view. We have a low emissions vehicle task force, which we sit on from Paris' point of view. Yeah, and this task is mm. top of their list, I suppose, deputy. <coughs> yes, because really serious matter. I mean, yeah. if we were talking about if we were talking about taking out, taking out diesel and petrol by tor by 2030, and we haven't even got around to putting the charging infrastructure in place, except what's being put there by the ESB, a standalone semi-state company, well then you know within the, within the, those two, the key departments. Yourselves in the Department of Energy, uh, you know that if that hasn't happened, uh, you know we're, we're we're not in a good place. And I would just urge that that needs to happen. I mean, obviously, you know the, the ministers have to push this as well with yourselves. Could, could I just ask you an answer to the other questions? Uh, the, the whole issue of the, of the disruptive technology fund. Just I asked you the question about that yeah. in relation to to is that aimed that you know for example Borden won it. You know, if they have to change from one technology to another, or DSP. Yeah, there's no, there's no reason why they can't apply, deputy. Mm -hmm. Like it's basically opened up to public bodies, commercial semi-states, private bodies. So there's nothing to prevent them from. Yes. From uh, if, if I'm not, if I'm mistaken, I'll come back. But I think that's the case. And and just the only other question that wasn't asked, Andrew Foley, was around renewable energy. I asked you the question in relation to the 50 million. Are there, you know, well that's announced now and it's in the capital program. Yeah. You know, do the officials, senior officials in the departments, any need to escalate that fund? As we move along, maybe so, 2021, 20, 22, those years, because so, yeah. you know we're not catching up to do here. So the, the 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 renewable side is funded through the electricity system, so it's 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 funded by user charges and uh, and the PSO as 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 appropriate. So it's not it's not directly funded by by the exchequer. The exchequer doesn't have a uh, have a role. There's a to the reef scheme. I haven't looked at this in a while, but to the reef scheme, there's a floor, there's a guaranteed price. So there is there is a subsidy there, uh, but there isn't direct exchequer exchequer funding. Oh, I understand that clearly. I'm not, I'm not confused about that whatsoever. What I'm asking you is a different question. Is the 500 million that's earmarked for climate action within the national, you know, it's paired along yeah. with the national development plan, are, are there any discussions at department level, at senior department level, you know, to escalate that fund as we move into 20, between 2020 so, and 2030? So we, we, yeah, so we, Specific we, we, question. Yeah, so uh, we haven't made a decision uh, on the future fund because we're just looking at the applications now for the first tranche of funding. But as I, as I mentioned earlier, Deputy, to answer your question, we, we are positively disposed towards these funds. <coughs> we think they're a good idea because they do encourage people to come forward with ideas. So, but we'll see, yeah. But there's, no, there's no reason why we shouldn't do it. I'm going to bring in Deputy, Deputy it's Nolan. The first final year of, sorry, no, it's the first call for proposals under that fund, so we just have to see how it actually works in reality. Um, you know, mm. We all think it's a good idea, and let's just see how it evolves like in terms of those proposals mm. that come in. I have a feeling there will be no shortage of applications for the 50 million. Thank you. Deputy Nolan. Sure. No, but, uh, Chair, uh, just in terms of the electric vehicles, and we've heard much about this initiative, but I just feel that there is not proper buy-in from people. And I take your point that the infrastructure is currently being developed for, uh, further, but there isn't buy-in from people. And you know, I know from my own constituency, Lee Shoffley, that there's very few charging points, and I know this point has been made um, in Lee Shoffley and indeed 
in the wider Midlands region. But are there any projected targets? Um, what would their projected target be to increase these points by 2030, we'd say, in the Midlands region? Do you actually have a target uh, plan done out? As, as you're aware, there's a, definitely there's a significant target for increase in the number of electric vehicles. It's 4,000 now, but I think it's due to come to a half a million mm. by 2030. So we are going to need yeah. a, a massive increase in the number of charging points. I think ESB have produced a, a paper there recently, uh, I'm not familiar with the details, which talks about how this will happen and how this will be implemented. But it, it's an enormous piece of infrastructure, yes? Mm. And it's... Uh, and would have, that would be their, their remit yeah, in relation to the They will have the rollout. details and all that, yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I think that concludes our session here this afternoon. I know it was a long session, but you're two very important departments, as you have gathered here this evening. Um, so thank you very much for coming before us, and we will publish any of the, um, your submissions to our website. So, as is no other business, the meeting of the Joint Committee is adjourned until next Wednesday, the 21st of November at 2pm. Thank you. <laughs>